welcome, 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 everybody. It is Tuesday, February 21st, 2023. You are on the line watching a little show we call Hostility, or if you're John Gleason, it's still called Host uh, Hostility. Uh, as we, we had a thing last night where he said the name wrong like four times in a row, and then he's like, oh, this time I'm going to get it right. Still got it wrong. Uh, welcome, I'm undecided. Everybody. Yeah. You haven't decided what? Which, which one's right? <laughs> which one? Well, both sound okay to me. I don't know. Yeah, so it's supposed to be a pun. It's it's spelled like hostility, but we capitalize yeah, host. Yeah, I do get that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and we host somebody and everything. Uh, joining me today is XJW, that is X Jehovah's Witness content creator, cult fighter extraordinaire, the one and only Lloyd Evans. Welcome, welcome, Lloyd. How you doing? I'm doing really, really well. Very excited to be here. Thanks very much for having me. I always get so excited when I see another Shure SM7B in the in the frame. I'm like, we know the audio today is going to be pristine. It's going to be wonderful. I don't know. It's... Yes, I too feel very fond of this particular model of microphone. It served me well. Yeah, I also like that we both use the whisper the whisper cover, even though neither of us use it for its intended purpose. I just prefer this shape for some reason uh, to the to the conic like a shape. shape on my microphone. That's right. I, I like I like a good, yeah. healthy tip. I want to know where the tip begins and ends. Uh, but it, they've got this padding, and that's I do like to. I sometimes do kiss the mic, and this padding is useful, so my spit never gets all the way you to mean the go really close. Re, oh, I touch really it really close. I'm tickling it with my beard right wow. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> this sounds like a different sort of show that we're doing right now, but okay, I'm, yeah. I'm done with it. Let's let's turn the gains way up. All right, welcome to X Cult ASMR. It's gonna get weird. Uh, today we are taking calls on specifically cults and cult stuff, XJW stuff. If you want to call though and challenge us as atheists on our atheism, we love to hear from uh, uh, theists who who want to challenge that. Theist guests always get the top priority. If you are an ex Mormon or an XJW, you've got an ex Mormon, or if, rather, if you are a Mormon. Or a JW, you have an ex Mormon and a JW. Though recently, I've I've realized, Lloyd, I don't. Uh, you have the privilege of much easier disfellowship from the ex JW. I am not excommunicated. Can you believe that? I am still a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, and at this point, I've done everything you're supposed to not do to get excommunicated. Still can't catch an excommunication, no matter what I do or who I fuck. And it's 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 been it's just been wild. So I assume that they want people to recognize that I'm actually a representative of the LDS Church. Uh, so if anything, yeah. if you're a Mormon and you got a problem, call me. I'm a Mormon too. I've noticed that they're extremely lax with their standards. I, I've played football with Mormons here in Zagreb, and yeah, they were calling me brother at one point, and I hadn't even gotten baptized or anything. So yeah, yeah. I think they just like, they 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 like to inflate the numbers. I think probably. Yeah, I, I yeah, they definitely don't like like their numbers off because they <laughs> they claim 18 million membership, but. Any like serious Not audit happening. of it has been somewhere between like four and eight, and yet they're still incredibly rich. In fact, while the intro was running, uh, I got a news alert on my phone, and they a government investigation just released its findings, which is that the Mormon Church hid thirty two billion dollars in assets, and as a result, the church has to pay. This is the real number: a four million dollar penalty. Four million. On thirty-two billion, that in doesn't sound assets. right to me. Yeah, something doesn't add up. So this is—I want to talk a little bit before we get into calls. Uh, don't forget the phone numbers on here: seven two zero six one nine two two eight eight. We'd love to talk to. Uh, if you have a question about, especially the Jehovah's Witness cult, uh, uh, and you're an atheist, that's we've got a couple atheist lines for that. But especially if you are a theist who wants to call with a challenge, uh, we would love to hear from you as well. Um, I, I, I want to, before we sort of jump into calls, sort of talk about some of these. I enjoy doing the compare and contrast with uh, people from other cults. And I wonder what you think the explanation is when, if we talk about uh, a cult, which is technically a part, it's a subset of mainstream Christianity, there's Christianity baked into it. A lot of people wouldn't agree that Mormons are Christian, so that's why I'm using this thing. The, the number one most harmful cult, it seems, in that Christian bubble uh, that's still that's still an extension of Christianity uh, and is mainstream, that people have mainstream awareness of it, 
uh, is it, it's got to be the Jehovah's Witnesses, but it's not far down below because I'm not talking about like the extreme little guys, like the you know those those Baptists that are holding up the signs at uh, our military yeah. funerals. So you've got like somewhere below that is the Mormon Church, and it's still way beyond as far as harmfulness, what how culty it is, way beyond a lot of other mainstream religions, uh, and yet. The Mormon Church may be the richest religious entity on the planet, including it may have more money than the Catholic Church. It won't have as much assets and political uh, uh, influence since they have like a whole ass state. But why why are the Jehovah's Witnesses so big, so prolific as a Christian cult, and have like no money? They're they're constantly selling off kingdom halls because they got to make the bills. This is actually a really interesting question. For me, um, I think that Jehovah's Witnesses are more interested in control than money. Yeah. So, we, we, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm, I obviously don't know as much about the Latter-day Saints churches as you do because you've been a member. Sure. I have, however, done a few studies with Mormon missionaries and, you know, I've done a little bit of digging. And I think almost from the outset, the LDS church has had some degree of kind of financial kind of greed yeah. as part of the DNA. I mean, that's what Joseph Smith was all about. He was Treasure all about hunter. kind of lifting lifting money from people's pockets yeah. for, you know, shady reasons. And yeah. and that's always been in the DNA of of, if you want to call it Mormonism. Whereas with Jehovah's Witnesses, they care more about control than money, which is why, as opposed to Mormonism, whereas Mormons will will even have their own university and will encourage higher education because they realize that if you have a rich following, then the church itself will be rich. Jehovah's Witnesses say, don't go to university or college because you'll get bad association there. Uh, we want you to stay uneducated we want you to stay as illiterate and uninformed as possible because then you're easier to control. Which it's an interesting, it's an interesting method because Mormons, like you said, they have their own university and everything. They won't try to shy mm. you away from higher education. They'll just try to control more where you get it. And then once you get it and people can can sort of claim, you know, here we have all these Mormon scholars and stuff. They're going to use you as the examples of, like, you, first of all, you're probably going to get a, a, a position if you get high enough. You're gonna the church is going to offer you money to do apologetics for them, uh, and it's just, it, it is weird because it's. I I have to say I think the Mormon model is also more successful because yeah, in the last couple of decades, the extreme response to you're a Mormon, oh, boom. It, it, the extremity of that spot response has reduced a ton. Some of that's because Mitt Romney ran for president and stuff too. But but I, I mean, going to going to school as a child, in uh, I, I remember it started in Florida, but in the South, you would have people who hear, oh, you're a Mormon? Oh, you're going to hell. And I was the only Mormon in my school. You just get greeted with like, you're going to hell by other children. Mm. Uh, and and now it's, it's, it's becoming more and more almost mainstreamed the Mormon church is, uh, but the Jehovah's Witnesses, nah, everybody's still just like, oh my God, it's them again at the door. Here they are. Here we go. Uh, and I wonder yeah. if if you see a future where they try to figure out a way to be so less contrasted with society and more accepted. Not at the moment. I did a video on that recently, actually, because someone uh, sent a voicemail in saying, do you think they're going to kind of soften their stance? Do you think they're going to kind of go a bit more mainstream and introduce reforms? And the really scary thing is that um, the governing body, as I understand it, is, although it's currently 10 members, there's one member in particular who's really pulling the strings, and that's Mark yeah. Sanderson. And he is particularly fond of the blood prohibition that's literally killing people. Um, to the point where, you know, I, I did a video on the channel covering like a leaked leaked footage of him schooling a, a, a group of elders on how to convince doctors to let babies die effectively. So if that's the sort of mind that's essentially in the driver's seat, then unfortunately I don't see the organization 
going mainstream or softening its stance anytime soon. Yeah. Um, but I think the, the the stuff that we've talked about already kind of highlights the fact that you can have the cult model of control and manipulation and it can function in all sorts of calibrations with completely different theologies because Mormonism and Jehovah's Witness theology is very different. Sure, sure, sure. Um, although it has its similarities. But, you know, like with the higher education thing and the, the focus on control versus the focus on education and getting money in, you can you can tweak it any any which way and still get it to work somehow, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting. It, 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 it's it's fascinating that they're still going. How old is this Mark Sanderson guy? He is, I think, in his. He's one of the youngest. He's in his fifties, I think. Gotcha. So we're we're a couple of generations away then from probably significant change. Because as he as he gets older, I assume he'll just gain more power uh, as anybody who could be considered his senior dies off. Exactly. Um, unfortunately, he's exactly the right age for him to be in, in the driver's seat for de potentially decades to come. See, whereas yeah. old Russie Nelson uh, of the Mormon church, the Mormon variety, is currently 98 years old. Uh, and <laughs> this is he guy, like some kind of palpatine? He's got like tubes going into his back or something he to looks, keep him on like life support. He looks Palpatine-esque. I'm not even kidding. He looks, and this is the guy where they're like, this is the modern Moses because he's getting up and he's like, well, I had another revelation. Let's get back to hand carts. Like that's, that's the level of not literally that, but he's going back in time. Uh, and what's funny mm. is growing up. So there's, there's a lot of interesting things in the church where anybody who is sort of more celebrated as good at something, they, they always inflate. Like uh, Russell Nelson was the one we knew growing up was like, a heart surgeon, but because he's a Mormon heart surgeon or was a Mormon heart surgeon, he's the best heart. He was, he was considered one of the best heart surgeons in the country. And then you find out that's not true. It's kind of like the rude awakening Mormons get when they, uh, when they find out that they're them saying, I've got a bachelor's degree from B Y U is not as prestigious to the real world as they were taught to expect. You could say, uh, yeah. any, any parallels uh, over, over there well my experience with the mormons i spoke to indicates that they have very very little exposure to anything kind of critical i mean yeah. they they seemed surprised when i even raised the whole thing with the lamanites yeah. and all you know the the curse and all that kind of stuff they they, they didn't even seem to be clued in on that and which is odd, know, just it's like right at the beginning of the yeah. book yeah You'd, you'd think that, that that would be one of the things that they're kind of trained to deal with when it comes to kind of arguments against their faith. But, you know, the, the missionaries I ran up against seem to have little or no training in, like, the main arguments against Mormonism, which yeah. I find very confusing. Yeah, because it's not like they're not investing lots of money. I mean, they have to right. pay for their own um, mission. Um, so you'd think that if they're going to be investing money... I, mind you, maybe that's the reason why they're ignorant because because it's the it's not the church's own money. Yeah. They don't really care how, how much the missionaries know or don't know. Yeah. I think it's more that the church is aware that if anything, they're probably trained, and if they are defiant of anything, they're probably trained to realize you aren't worth converting quickly. Uh, mm. That it's like you need to prey upon the ignorance of the church. Don't bring up the cursed stuff. The average person we're going to baptize isn't going to hear that for the first four years of their membership. Uh, you know, don't bring up, uh, uh, it, it, it's more of just a like, yeah, so forget about here's like counter apologetics, here's debate points or anything like that. Let's just go with like, so what's hard about your life uh, and where can the church fit into it at, a, at the low, low cost yeah. of 10% of your must income? must be screwed up in some way. How yeah. can we help? <laughs> yeah, which it's yeah. funny because one of the things they do is uh, if they like, if they come to an older person's house or they've, I've seen them do it with younger people too, but it's one of the go-tos where they're like, hey, we'd like to talk to you about the church. And they're like, well, no thanks. It's like, okay, well, listen, uh, we're here anyway. Is there any, are there any yard chores or anything like that you need help oh, with? Oh, they said that to me, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. They, and this was wanna, after I this was wanna. after I told them that I I basically didn't see our 
our conversations progressing because I did like a series called Lloyd Meets the Mormons. Yeah. And I, it was basically just m mostly me re recapping my conversations after I'd had them while it was still fresh in my mind. Yeah. And the last time I spoke to them and I, I was saying, you know, look, I, I feel like we're just kind of going around in circles and I'm making arguments and you're not really answering them. Um, you know, maybe we should leave it here. And then after I said that, they were like, by the way, if you want any work doing, yeah, <laughs> just just let us know, right? And we'll we'll come around and we'll do. It's like, yeah, that's really. They they must genuinely think that's going to win you back, right? It's like, oh, they've not answered any of my questions. They're not giving me any meaningful information here, but at least they'll work for me. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's keep us in your orbit. You're asking us to leave. Let let me figure out a way to stay. It's it's sort of creepy fuckboy stuff, really. Like. Oh yeah. man, I, yeah, I hear it. I should go, but can I use your bathroom real quick? Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Just sit in the sit in the bathroom, going like, okay, what can I say next? Uh, I don't have to pee. I got to start making pee sounds at some point. Uh, and just yell, sorry, it turned into something else. I'll be a minute. Uh, you know that sort of gross. It's it's gross stuff. It's it's weird, and it's it's yeah. also that and it's probably, it's sad, really. It's kind of you feel sorry for them because you're like God, you know. You, You'd like to think that that they have a bit more dignity, yeah, to, as to understand when, you know, when th when they're being insufficient with their message, yeah. But for some reason, it's always a problem with you, and it's always a case of well, how can we how can we salvage them? How can we bypass the logic and just get straight to their emotions? Yes, you know? exactly, exactly, and and try yeah. to try to even make it. I, let's make the story that he tells one day not a bunch of Mormons came over and couldn't answer basic questions. Let's turn it into some Mormons came over and they trimmed my yard. It looks so Chucked nice. My right firewood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tremendous. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, yeah that's, it, it's trying to shift the narrative basically. Uh, I guess, I guess last thing before we'll, we'll jump into calls here. Reminder, uh, we've got at least an atheist line. We've got some theist lines open. 720-619-2288. If you've got a question about cults, you've got a challenge about cults, you want to, uh, uh, challenge us on our atheism. You want to say Mormonism's great, whatever else. 720-619-2288. If you are calling from outside of the U.S., there is a web link in the description and you can call with the web caller. Or if you're calling from within the U.S. and you've got like terrible theistic family uh, that monitor your phone bill. I don't know. I don't know what the, what the, what the reasons might be, but those are your options down below. Uh, last question. What happens to me when Jehovah returns, according to the JWs? When he, well, he's not, he's not returning. He's always there looking down on you when you're masturbating and all sorts. But sure. um, you're, you're toast. We're, we're both toast when Armageddon comes, I'm afraid. We're both going to um, be on the wrong end of a fireball. And that's, uh, are we I on the to, same wrong end? It it. Is it like worse for you because you were a witness and now I, but I never was? Like, is there, is there tears of punishment? I guess we'll have to wait and see when it happens, but. I, yeah. I would suggest that it's it's probably the same. Okay. I mean, it might even be easier for me, depending on what part of the world I'm in. Maybe maybe I'll just get like a, a building collapse on me, whereas you'll get the fireball. Um, right. I don't know. Right. So, I live yeah. in a fireball. This is Texas. It's they're gonna need something <laughs> more more intense than a fireball. That's just that's just June for us. Yeah. Uh, I <laughs> got my AC set to fifty five. Um, yeah, I, I, it's an interesting question because there's, there's different, all of these death cults, there's different consequences, right, to your, to what's going to happen. And so, uh, uh, it's, in Mormonism, it's funny though, because everybody now goes to heaven. There used to be, you're going to be destroyed for eternity, basically, because you said Joseph Smith sucks. But now it's everybody, you got to heaven and you got to heaven. And now they try to incentivize you on. But of heaven, isn't it? Right. Right. It's like it's, it's like it's a department store. Yeah. And <laughs> you you might find yourself in like the haberdashery yeah. or or the food section or you might find yourself where they're selling the furniture, you know. Right. Uh, right. And in yeah. their world like you don't want to just be in the food court, you want to be at Nordstrom's. It's like exactly. it's like there's the yeah. better parts of the mall <laughs> and then there's all the riffraff hanging out with Hitler and Anne Frank down in the lowest level because that's how it works right now is the two of them at present are only going to the lowest heavens, Hitler and Anne Frank. Uh, really great, 
really great. Uh, well, the good uh, news for you is that if you die before Armageddon comes, you will get resurrected because you've never been a Jehovah's Witness. But because I mm. have been a Jehovah's Witness and I've left, right. I've committed like the unforgivable sin, so I won't be brought back after Armageddon. So the, there is, you, you are slightly better off than me. You're dead, dead at that point too, right? It's not a hell thing with them. It's a, you just you cease to exist. I'm, I'm properly, I am an ex Lloyd. <laughs> Which is like, yeah. what's, what's the alternative? What's Jehovah's Witness heaven look like? Uh, well, there's two, uh, uh, and it's like a department store with only two levels. So there's the earth level where you get to live on a paradise earth and, and mess around with pandas and eat watermelons um, and take part in kind of, um, terraforming the planet into a Jehovah's Witness only zone that welcomes yeah. back resurrected people, and then yeah. you have like this this exclusive club in the heavens of the one hundred and forty four thousand who rule over the earth. And coincidentally, all ten members of the governing body are in that number of one hundred and forty four thousand. Of course, so. they are. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> That makes sense. It sounds like some second anointing shit like we have in Mormonism that they only found out a couple of years ago. Uh, it's it's this ritual they have where basically you can on earth be forgiven of all sins past and future and guaranteed a spot in the celestial kingdom. And it works like a pyramid scheme where it's like, all right, now that we've done you, you go find two friends and then they get to nominate two friends and they get to nominate. But it was this super secret ritual until a few years ago when a, an ex, I think it was an ex stake president uh, got out of the church. Anyway, uh, we'll jump on to calls. I, I, there's there's one here that I'm very interested in because there's a, a, a question that's pretty good there. But if you've got a question you want to call in about cults, uh, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, cults in general, how to identify a cult. If you've got questions about, uh, I don't know, the well, I, I, I would love to have some. We currently don't have any argumentative theists lined up, uh, but I would love to have some argumentative theists call in if you've got an argument for us, why we should believe in God, why we should still believe in Mormonism or the Jehovah's Witness thing. Uh, would love to hear from you. Um, so I'm sending off some notes, but we're going to jump in, uh, to this now. Let's talk to Mary, who is calling from Florida, old friend of the show. I, I by old, I mean old in relation to how old the show is. Not, <laughs> not Mary. I couldn't make such a claim. Mary, how are you doing? You are on the line. I'm, I'm doing well. Um, I'm so glad you have Lloyd on. I've watched his work for a long time. Um, one of my favorite little clips of Lloyd. How are you doing, Lloyd? <laughs> I'm doing well, thanks, Mary. Thanks for calling in. Um, one of my favorite clips of you is with Matt when you talked about the um, onslaught of nutters that called in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At the end of the show. That was on the atheist experience, yeah. Yes, yeah, um, but I have some que I have some Mormon questions and some JW questions because, um, as a mother of of a one son, I would never think of uh, shunning my son and never speaking to him again. Uh, that's I, I can't even comprehend that. But um, one question I have is um, the. Um, Recently, I have a couple of questions, if y'all don't mind. I recently saw about Norway. Um, uh, what did they do in relation to the Jehovah's Witnesses? Because they found the shunning to be inhumane. Am I correct on that, Lloyd? Yeah. So uh, no, there's been quite a lot happening in Norway Um Ex-Jehovah's Witness activists have really made a lot of headway in in bringing um, issues like shunning to the light of journalists and the government. And the situation in Norway was that the Jehovah's Witnesses, like every other religion, used to receive a bunch of money uh, on an annual basis just for being a religion. It's like, hey, you're a religion. Have some wow. money. And... So what they managed to do in Norway was um, get the government to reword the legislation so that you couldn't 
receive the money um, or or be recognized as a religion if you were violating people's human rights by shunning. Um, and obviously that's what Jehovah's Witnesses do. So the Norwegian government has both um, withheld the funding from Jehovah's Witnesses, which they're very upset about, and they have also um, made moves to strip Jehovah's Witnesses of their religious status so um it's quite a fast moving situation and i don't know what the very latest is with it but that's that's the last that i've looked into it yeah is this like is this the type of laws that exist in there are other european countries i think germany might be one where you can have in the same system that takes is your takes your taxes out you can designate where your quote unquote tithing goes to and basically they'll take your tithing and distribute it to the church too is it basically that same system yeah, it's unfortunately in in many European countries, like you know, veneration and deference to religion is kind of baked into the political and uh, you know tax laws. And uh, yeah, it, so in Norway, it's just an automatic thing that all religions get this funding. And uh, so yeah, they they managed to stop Jehovah's Witnesses from getting it. And I forget what the exact figure was it was something like one and a half million euros or something which you know isn't a huge amount of money but it's it's significant um you can do a lot with it and uh i'm i'm delighted uh i i wish that more governments could take cults seriously in this way to be honest it, it feels like i i often say it feels like we're at the wrong point in history i i feel like we shouldn't be in a situation where an organization like Jehovah's Witnesses can just keep a database of accused pedophiles, you know, on at its headquarters and not be forced to hand it into the authorities. And, you know, this isn't just kind of just wild speculation. It's there's documented proof that they're doing it. Um, and it's nice to know that at least in some countries, they're starting to take it seriously. Um, but we're, we're a long way away, sadly, from countries like America and the UK um, doing this sort of thing, because I, I think there's a, a heck of a lot of deference to religion still in those yeah. countries. Yeah, I'm, it's, here the main thing being to, you don't have to pay taxes on contributions uh, in, in America, which in a way I actually think has been a more successful funding system. Uh, and And not only that, like, there's a limit, I believe, but let's say I make, uh, uh, we'll just go with an easy number to work with. Nobody jump the gun and say, oh, that's what Jimmy says he makes. According to YouTube, or according to Google, I'm worth $5 million. I can't take that shit to the bank, though. Uh, turns out every time I go to try and withdraw any amount of that, they're like, uh, Google's not a, that's not correct. But let's say I made $100,000 a year. In a six figure salary, and I, I, you know, where is it? I want to yeah, see yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, say I make $100,000 in a year because 100 is always the nicest number to run with. Uh, in America, I can donate. So let's let's just go with what the tithing is, 10%. So the tithe is 10%. Well, so that takes me down to uh, uh, 10, or that's obviously $10,000. And then let's say I do another $5,000 in fast offerings, basically, which is another type of contribution that you do with the Mormon church. It's just not the mandated one. Basically, the the... U.S. will now tax my income as though I made $85,000 instead of $100,000. So it's not as though it, it, it's, it's not free money. It's not that you get for every $10,000 you get, you get $10,000 back or something. You don't get it as a credit on like, oh, this increases my... There's a lot of people who don't understand these systems fundamentally, and that's the only reason I'm bringing it up. Uh, but it does basically turn it into, I gave the Mormon church... 15,000 of my $100,000 and that should not be treated as basically subjective uh, uh, income that I decided to do with like everything else. It's just wild that the money that I have to put into paying rent to live, paying for utility, let's just say that's uh, uh, $30,000 in a year. Let's say my cost of living is between rent, utilities, keeping clothes on, keeping food in my belly. Uh, uh, we'll even not, we'll say internet is like a, is, is a, is a luxury and it's not included. Let's just say that's $30,000 for a year between everything, uh, just to basically be alive and eat things other than ramen. 
I have to pay in the U.S. on that $30,000 as taxes because that's not as important and, and, and fundamental to my soul as if I then gave $30,000 to a church. The, the me completely choosing for myself to give $30,000 of money I've made goes away and doesn't get tax, but the $30,000 I need to be alive, that money gets taxed. And that's, that's just a wildly bullshit system, in my opinion. Uh, chose terrible, terrible priorities. I, I I really struggle with understanding why why religions get any tax breaks because I mean granted I'm I'm an atheist so I'm biased on this but sure um, I I just think that religion is ultimately a product that some people need or want and others don't yes um, I totally agree and and I I think that you know when religions do charity that's fantastic and you know let's be honest a heck of a lot of charities. Are, are funded by by religions but if, if you want to if you're a religious church or a religious organization and, and you want to do charitable work set up a charity and let the charity not pay any tax uh, it, when it comes to your religion and you promoting your religion why should others be funding that or why should you not be contributing to society exactly. so i really struggle to be honest it's yeah. way more justified as a luxury than fucking your life bills are and it's if anything mm. i'm sort of like i don't know that those dollars shouldn't be taxed higher than average tax stuff like like this is commodity luxury bullshit it's it's yeah. I, I, the only reason people don't feel that way about it is they've they've been so predatory about it and it's like no don't tax me on the dollars that i'm using to get into heaven i need that heaven are you going to tax me out of heaven that's that's the sort of stupid shit they would do uh, anyway, sorry, Mary, yeah. we took that over. I know you had more questions. What was what was your next one? <laughs> um, are there any reliable numbers of uh, J, uh, JW losing members real quick, either since the pandemic or just figuring out due to um, Internet information this, like, why am I doing this? Are, are, are there any, or can you not get reliable data of people leaving? You can get um, information and data. Um, how reliable it is, uh, is up for, for debate because it's figures that are published by Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, but even if you take those figures, they're not very flattering. Um, you'll be pleased to know that in America, for the 2022 service year report, which was the latest one that they published, um, Jehovah's Witnesses in America actually declined. So, you know, you guys have fewer Jehovah's Witnesses uh, in as of 2022 than you had the year before. Um, overall, worldwide, the organization grew by only 0.4%, which when you factor in the fact that births and deaths account for like 1%, overall population growth is, you know, effectively in real terms, a decline. So, um, you know, at best, the group is stagnating. Um, and the numbers were down in the top three countries where you where there are the most Jehovah's Witnesses, namely America, Brazil, and Mexico. Um, I did a video on it, you know, the numbers aren't looking healthy, even if you take the organization's own figures at face value. Okay, and are the um, are the Mormons as I've seen the videos from JW where the family and like they've shunned their kid and kicked them out of the house, and then the kid calls on the phone and the parents don't answer because you you know you have to shun them, and um, are the Mormons that strict on shunning like the JWs are? Jimmy? Sorry. Oh, man. I was replying to chats about my net worth. Uh, shunning, you, you were asking about if the Mormons are as strict on shunning and, like, reinforcing it. Is that what the question was? It, like, like JWs seem to be. It's Not like at all. If, you know, you kick your kid out at 16. It's like yeah. you don't even let them make contact with you. Are the Mormons no. that strict with the shunning or a little more? Shunning is culturally reinforced. It's not reinforced by the church. And so it's more of a thing of... 
the extreme division that is put between you and your family is what causes uh, a sort of almost colloquial colloquial shunning. Um, and it is, it, it, it really goes family to family. And so one thing that you'll notice is that it's mostly going to be fam- So I've always talked about the cult within the cult and within Mormonism, you, Mormonism being the bigger cult, but you have family cults as well, especially amongst like some of the more prominent families, uh, in the church. And so, uh, if you've, if you've watched that, um, Andrew Garfield series that came out, oh man, it, I'm losing what the thing is called now. Uh, what that show is called, but it's a, a series about murder, uh, a murder that happened in this town in Utah amongst this full, fully Mormon. And it was these fundamentalist Mormons trying to, uh, anyway, I, I, I don't want to give away spoilers either, but the, the name of the series is escaping me right now. Uh, this is what happens when you don't eat breakfast kids. Um, but anyway, a really great series, but uh, there are families within that are prominent and they operate almost as an internal cult where the father and the patriarch of that family is the head of that, that sort of smaller mini cult within the cult. And so in my family, we definitely had that without the prominence because it's still modeled. So we had like, uh, almost a tiny cult, uh, a trademark, tiny cult. Uh, we had like a <laughs> tiny cult. I have, you know, I have 12 siblings. So it's basically my dad's the head. Uh, uh, and then there are other people within it that aren't just directly his kids, but it's like, you know, his brother and their family. Uh, uh, he had some level of still that position at some point, his, uh, as grandparents got older. Um, but uh, to be clear, and and so uh, like I, I don't ever I never want anybody to mistake this. If they hear about me talking about the fact that my family and I are no contact, I am the one who decided that. Uh, they they were well enough to as long as they weren't ever asked to confront or acknowledge their abuses, they would have been fine with you know staying in to some level. And if I called them right now my dad would pretend nothing had happened and we'd probably joke about food and, and our inability to stop eating delicious foods over the, uh, and our high cholesterol. Like we'd, we'd probably be joking and laughing, but it's, it's, um, yeah, it's sort of like, yeah, thank you. Hashtag tiny cult. Uh, uh, it's, it's not technically a, a policy to shun, but you are raised with the idea that ex Mormons and anti Mormons are the scum of the earth. They are miserable right. and they want to make you miserable too. That's their whole thing is like, and so your perception too. So when your, when your child comes and says, I don't believe anymore immediately, it's, well, first of all, I know that you actually do believe in my head. I know that you actually do believe you just want to sin. And that sin is probably sexual and you probably just want to drink and do drugs and, and all the most fun things in life. You probably want to do those things. And that's your motivation. You actually do know it's true, but you just want to be miserable and Satan has a hold of you and you're trying to undermine the eternity of our family and you want to take everybody else out, which is why you also, if you're the first one out, you start getting blamed when people follow after you, even though you did nothing to uh, assist in there. Every That's right. very much right. what happened in my family. So it's it's a culturally reinforced thing of like, your family probably won't necessarily eject you, though some will. Some are that extreme. But more often you're going to get, we won't eject you. We'll just be hostile to your very existence until you eject yourself. Yeah. So the the it seems like the J, JW shining is Policy. so detrimental. I, yeah. Oh, I yeah. always think of... And, of, and, of and just to be Moore clear to about... Help. Yeah. Sorry, go on, Mary. Uh, just when I think of Owen Morgan, you know, and and um, like I said, I have an adult son, and and you know, sometimes I get upset with him, but I, I would never, not ever speak to him or not want to know how he's doing. So I I can't even comprehend it. But um, it seems like the JWs are just, you know, it's very cut and dry. You're cut off. You're done. It's over. Mm. Which I don't, yeah. I don't so- get. Uh, well, the reason why you don't get it is because you're in touch with your humanity, you know, and, you know, I'm a dad and I, well, you know, from the moment you become a parent, uh, you feel this overwhelming surge of, of love for your children and yeah. the thought of ever being separated from them for any reason fills you with, with dread. 
And and th- those are kind of normal parental feelings. Those those are normal instincts that we have. You know, you know, biologically and through our evolution, there are reasons why parents will feel that way about their children. Um, but with Jehovah's Witnesses, um, it's not just like a cultural thing as it is in the LDS Church. You are commanded to shun. So that means that even though it's instinctively going against every fiber of your being to shun your son or daughter, you are commanded to. So your your choice is irrelevant. You know, if, if you want to make it through Armageddon, you have to cut off your son or daughter. So that's the key difference. And um, I, I wish that there were no shunning whatsoever in either cult. I think that even when it's cultural or implied, it can still do immense damage, as it does in story after story coming out of the LDS church. Uh, but for sure, when you actually make it a hard and fast rule and people's existential dread is attached to their obedience to this rule, it does a lot more damage. Yeah. Yeah, there's actually yeah. there's something to be said about what you just yeah mentioned on the LDS side, because there's such a family is like the thing they're usually trying to sell. You know what we'll give you for the re- that the other churches won't eternity with your family as a family, uh, and that's that's one of the the key selling points. And family is very much harped upon in the way that a lot of people mistake that then for having a healthy family as opposed to what what the church is calling a good family. So one of the things that actually might be worse about it, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses are extreme, but I'm saying in, there are cases where you're going to find people, and I probably was one where uh, uh, it was really awful, is that still the loyalty you feel to your family as a mandate doesn't go away when you leave the church. And so it may be that you literally are essentially choosing to just keep exposing yourself to abuse because I can't let my family go. I, I have to, you know, it's my that's my family, as though that phrase means something. Uh, uh, that phrase should mean something, but it doesn't inherently mean anything. Uh, and because family should be who you choose and who you uh, are, yeah. you behave like family with, not who you happen to have right. been born. You're you are incidentally related to, and so if anything, I think I I if I could go back and change something, I'd have I'd have gone no contact much sooner. I'd I'd have I've got I've gone to, and well, I, I should say no contact isn't I. It's the quick, easy way. I can still receive and send a cordial message from time to time. You know, still now, years later, for some reason, a piece of mail will show up to my parents' house. Uh, uh, and so, you know, that's, it's not like if they're like, hey, this bit of mail showed up. Do you want it shredded? And I'm like, you are cut off. How dare But there are members of my family who, if they, re- if they messaged me, I would literally say like, hey, no. I don't, whatever your issue is, whatever your problem is, I'm not the person. It ain't me. Get out of here. Um, yeah. But not my parents. And, and one more question real quick, and I'll let y'all go. Sure. Lloyd, it seems like I heard you, um, I think maybe you explained it to your daughter about Jehovah's Witnesses, and it was like, you know, eight or nine evil men in this building in the northeast of the United States that tell, I don't know, 8 million people what to do? Is that mm. the correct summary of a statement I heard you when say When she was younger, yeah, I've, I've had to update it since then. Um, because, so yeah, when she was younger, um, I, I really kind of grappled with how to explain, what, you know, the, the whole thing with religion to her. and Because obviously religion was having such a profound effect on our family relationships and so i settled on this thing called the bad men where i said there are these bad men who who live in a forest by a lake and they control uh, the minds of millions of people around the world and they're so powerful in controlling people that they can they can teach people to stop loving each other and all of that's true because the Jehovah's Witness headquarters really is in a forest by a lake. Um, but I've so now she's eight and she's in a situation where, you know, she goes to school every day with Catholics and she's having to kind of understand the broader 
nuances of of religious belief um and so oh. I, i've i've just kind of <laughs> yeah so i i've had to say let's stop saying bad men let's kind of move that to one side and let's just say you know this is we're talking about religion and when we're talking about the the particular individuals or the particular group that controls members of our family we're talking about jehovah's witnesses so she's she's just reached a, a level of maturity where i can just be even more frank with her and the other day we were walking through zagreb and uh, there were some jehovah's witnesses stood by the carts and i said to her you see jessica darling those are jehovah's witnesses and she said um and, and what are they what are those pictures about and i said they're they're talking about paradise, darling. They, they believe that um, one day uh, God is going to kill everybody who isn't a Jehovah's Witness and there's going to be a paradise. And she just immediately, instinctively said, it wouldn't be a paradise if people are being killed. <laughs> so yes, I love the fact it. that she just immediately got it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I appreciate talking to both of you, and um, have, good, have a good evening, and I look forward to listening to the rest of the show. Thank you, Mary. Thank, Thank you, Mary. Bye. Yeah, there's there's a lot of interesting things sort of uh, about recognizing, and, and and now we obviously we talk about as the world is becoming more secular, more people who are secular are wanting exclusively secular resources I get paid five dollars every time I say secular uh, to raise their children. That's why I said it what nine times in that sentence uh, uh, to raise their children. Re- what was that word you were saying again? S- secular. Uh, uh, okay, they want the, the, yeah. the seculars want secular resources to raise their children in a secular manner. Is all I'm saying. Secular, secular, secular. Uh, and so as that's happening, we're having these conversations about it. One of the things that I find fascinating is if you how obvious learned behaviors are becoming that everybody else used to think was a default because people genuinely in their heart think because they de- feel like they defaulted to God exists and don't realize that it was a result of indoctrination uh, are, are unable to fathom that if you don't teach children about God, they don't just intuit it, especially if yeah. you are teaching them things about, hey, if there's a question out there, there's probably an answer. But if there isn't an answer, there may one day, because we're limited, we've only been doing science for this long, uh, uh, there may one day be an answer. And, and maybe you should be the person who's like, motivated to go answer that question or some unanswered question. People make careers out of identifying the questions that aren't answered yet and looking for a way to answer them. And it's incredible. And and when you raise a child with that, and none of that is any, is anything remotely untrue that any religious person could disagree with, even though it's upon that basis that many of their disagreements come, uh, when you teach a child that, they don't default to, well, then, you know, God of the gaps makes sense, or, yeah, this, the, you know, genocide being necessary occasionally to make the world a better place. I'm getting that. Uh, uh, all these things that that seem so obvious to people. And there's there's a lot of things that I think we have to re-examine that people think by default. I know it was one of the things that um, uh, uh, Matt and I had disagreed on, which is there's a principle which says that uh, there's a reason why a lot of people think everything is designed, especially as you get into smaller structures, that everything has the appearance of design. Genuinely, I think that's also a learned behavior. I don't think if you, if you are not raised with because as, for me, there was a lot of things that as soon as I recognized it as something I was raised with and that it was a learned behavior, I truly dropped it. Like I truly was like the idea that a God is inherent uh, uh, it being a learned behavior. As soon as I, I, I learned about that, I truly dropped it. And the same thing with the appearance of design, uh, that that's a learned behavior. And so I, uh, I, I don't know. I wonder what other things there are out there that we need to reexamine on the basis of the assumption that these are defaults that aren't these axioms that people things people believe are axioms that aren't. I've not come up against anything in my two kids that would suggest that they kind of swerve towards uh, religious belief kind of inherently. Yeah. Uh, the only the only area of parenting that I found challenging is um, mortality um, because yeah. <laughs> they pretty soon realize that things die. Or, or the possibility of, of things dying and they 
fairly quickly get terrified of the prospect of people sure. they care about dying, especially, especially their parents. And so I've had um, quite a few conversations about that and and about, you know, yeah, but um, is that it? You know, are you just going to be gone? And it's like, yeah. yes, sweetheart, I am going to be gone. But the thing is, what that just makes the time that we have now more precious yeah. because it's going to run out at some point. So we have to care about each other and we have to enjoy time with each other and make the very most of it and and the more i say it um the, the less it becomes an issue sure to the point where I've, i i can't even remember the last time i've had to say that but that, some that's of it's, been the only real challenge yeah some of it's an age thing too i mean the the your your children the younger they are the higher the percentage of your dependence for their very survival is uh because i can remember yeah it would have been sometime around 2002 but i remember uh, probably earlier than that, actually, but living in Florida uh, and having a little sister who at that time would have been like six or seven years old, basically saying that, you know, when, if, if, if mom ever dies, I'll just kill myself. Uh, and it's like, well, no, you won't because it's probably not going to be soon, but also there's a lot of, th and, and it, their, their perception of, of, because there isn't a concept to them yet of the idea of living without you. They quite literally at the moment can't live without you, except for the mostly because they don't know the systems that would come in to replace you if you did die. Uh, and so it's, mm. it's just very interesting how, yeah, it's, it's stuff. It's stuff that, that changes as you get older. It's axioms that need, or accepted axioms that need challenge. They're not actually axioms. Um, and yeah, oh, I don't know. Anyway, it's, it interests me. I could ramble about it for, another couple hours and get several thousand more seculars in. But instead, we'll go and talk to Timmy in Oklahoma. Uh, Timmy, you are on the line. Hi, Jimmy. Hello. Hi, Timmy. Hi, I'm a big fan of yours. Oh, well, it's all downhill from here. Uh, thank you, Timmy. Hey, thank you. I had a question for Lloyd, though. Sure. Um, how Talk did to me. you verify the age of the prostitute? Yeah, go fuck yourself. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, there was always there had to be one. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I go to I go to Thailand on holiday, and it has to be to do with sex tourism. So every time, I'm sure. Uh, mm. Brittany from Kansas. Brittany from Kansas, you're on the line. Hi. Uh, yeah, I had a question for Lloyd. Um, I was not an ex-Jehovah's Witness, but my partner uh, was uh, for the better part of the 90s and a little bit of the 80s. Sure. And I brought him some stuff that Lloyd has put videos up of, um, uh, a lot of it around like Caleb and Sophia videos, commentary. Um, Those and videos are a trip for sure. I <laughs> My partner had, I asked him, I wanted to ask if my partner had any questions he wanted to ask Lloyd, and he did have one. Um, so I'm bringing that to y'all. <laughs> okay. And um, it looks like it's so about the is, ramping up propaganda of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah. So he described it like as some of the stuff that I brought as propaganda. That's more his word than mine. But uh, yeah, I would say, Lloyd, do you feel like uh, from the time span of the 90s to like now that the Jehovah's Witnesses have ramped up things like propaganda? Uh, for example, Caleb and Sophia, or in any other way? Uh, their um, well, definitely, in, at least in terms of video propaganda, because in the 90s, I can remember it was just the occasional video, like VHS release that we used to get. And it was like a big, it was so rare for them to produce a video that it was like a big deal. It's like, wow, there's a video. And hey, this is going to make family worship so much easier because we can just stick a video in the VHS player and and just zone out for like an hour. Um, but 2014 was when they published the first JW Broadcasting episode. Two years before that, in 2012, was when they um, unveiled Caleb and Sophia. So especially since kind of 2012, they've really been pushing hard on the video propaganda I think it was around 2015, 2016 that they started to um, show videos at their annual conventions as well. So the annual 
uh, regional conventions are just like a video propaganda marathon that goes on for three days. <laughs> and it causes a real headache for me and Tibor, my video editor, because we've got to troll through all that and pick out the highlights and the <laughs> stuff that's worth talking about. Um, I think they've always been about propaganda. And arguably, you could say that whereas they they used to produce the same amount of propaganda um, in the 90s and maybe even before the 90s, um, it's just changed its format. So they used to produce a heck of a lot of printed material. Mm -hmm. they, they drastically reduced their printed material over the last 20 years or so, and it's kind of switched to, to videos. And now when you go to a Kingdom Hall meeting, as I did, I, I think, was it how long ago? Like, I think it was last week. I went to a Kingdom Hall meeting for the first time in a while. And they have video monitors either side of the platform. And they're showing you videos throughout the meeting. But that's how kind of video oriented worshippers as Jehovah's Witness now is. So I would I would probably say in, in, in some ways, it's the same amount of propaganda, but definitely in terms of video propaganda which has a unique ability to tug at the heartstrings and play on people's emotions definitely it's accelerated since around 2012. that's kind of where my, my mind was going as well like it it tugs at the heartstrings in a different way but also um it maybe it feels more prevalent in the sense it's so easier to disseminate maybe um and get into different people's hands quicker um do you feel like it's been balanced as far as outreach externally to try and bring people into their organization versus internal to keep them in? Because that kind of feels like what Cable and Sophia represents is keeping people in young. <laughs> I, I think that's a really good point, actually. I think that that's one of their major Achilles heels is that because they live in this bubble where everything just makes total sense to them and they don't come up against anything or anyone that challenges their views. They're incapable really of any kind of self-awareness when it comes to how is this material going to play in front of people who don't know anything about Jehovah's Witnesses. And so they will bombard you with videos at their conventions that are well, it's the same thing with Caleb and Sophia. You know, Jimmy knows all about it because he's done a number of rebuttals to this stuff. I mean, this this stuff is completely tone deaf. And it only yeah. begins to make sense when you've been subjected to years or decades of indoctrination as a Jehovah's Witness. So, yeah, I think that's actually one of the things that makes our job easier whenever we're doing our rebuttals is, is that they don't even think about you know, they don't even try to understand the perspective of a non-believer because they can't. It, the people producing this stuff have been almost hermetically sealed in this environment of unquestioning devotion for years, if not decades. And that makes, I think that makes it harder for their propaganda to hit its intended target in many cases. Very good. Um, I had, I feel like you answered the question, uh, for him and I think he'll be really interested in, in those thoughts. Um, I did kind of have a follow-up question, uh, that's kind of from my thoughts of just being around him for as long as I have. Sure. Um, please, but you guys have time. Yeah. yeah. So, um, one of the things that I thought about, uh, from like how his family kind of fell out of the religion, I wonder if it happened easier than maybe most people trying to leave the Jehovah's Witness religion for two reasons. It was a smaller community. So um, he theorizes a little bit that maybe the shunning maybe wasn't so intense. Uh, he doesn't remember being aware of it. He fell out of it when he was still uh, not even a teenager. Um, and he be got into it because uh, he, he was born into essentially a mixed faith marriage. Um, so his, one of his parents was a Jehovah's Witness and the other one was a RLDS, a Reformed Latter-day Saint. And uh, I just wonder, do you think that that element of it, that they brought them in as a mixed faith marriage made it a very different experience to fall out of it? Have you ever seen anything like that? 
for sure. I mean, the everyone's experience is different, and you know, no no two experiences within Jehovah's Witnesses are, are the same. And you know, this is one of the problems I run into on the channel is that um, you know people will watch my videos and they'll have a completely different experience themselves of Jehovah's Witnesses, where, for example, you know, they're not being shunned, even though they're living a very worldly lifestyle. Um, it's it's just obvious that, well, I say obvious, it's, um, it's just the case that when you have a, a worldwide global organization with millions of members, no matter how much you try to make it um, unified and have conformity so that everyone is controlled to the same extent. You know, everyone's going to have different circumstances, as, as you've explained um, with with your partner, whereby, for whatever reason, it, it's just not quite as, as traumatic um, or, or where people don't take the religion quite as seriously or where there's a, a slightly different experience. So it doesn't surprise me, really. Um, it, yeah, it doesn't surprise me that, that, that he's had that experience. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your thoughts so much. I'm so excited I got through uh, to talk to you guys. It's really, really sweet of you to call Brittany. Thank you. Yeah, it was great talking to you, Brittany. Thank you. Bye-bye. Sure. Bye-bye. Uh, that number down below, 720-619-2288. We actually had, uh, we were down to three lines, had three people on them, and two of them have dropped. So right now, if you're a theist or an atheist and you'd like to call on, now is the time, 720-619-2288, or the link in the web description. What happens, Lloyd, in uh, with the shunning situation if it is a child which a person doesn't really have the option to shun, right? I mean, there's the, if, if I'm responsible for a 14-year-old kid, uh, I, it's probably a little too late to just go, well, now I'm putting you up for adoption. Uh, what happens in that scenario where the kid goes, I don't believe I'm not going to participate. Fuck off. Is that, is that a thing yeah. that happens and, and what happens then? So there are a few loopholes. I mean, I wish there were more. Um, yeah. but for example, if you, if your husband or wife gets disfellowshipped, you're not required to shun them. Um, you, you know, you're you're expected to stay married to them, um, and yeah, so you okay. have a, like a normal relationship in that situation. And if you have a, a child who is below the age of eighteen, typically, or who is is a minor and dependent on you, even in some cases after the age of eighteen, if if they are kind of demonstrably dependent on their parents, um, that there won't be an expectation for the parents to immediately kind of kick them out. So that's that's kind of the, the, there are a number of loopholes to cover those those areas. Sure. Um but isn't it a shame that they can't be a bit more lenient and say, "Hey, you know what? If it's family, right. why are we applying verses about cutting off the evil doer from your midst, you know? Surely yeah. we can keep the family out of that and make that purely about the congregation, you know. So then what about with public figures when you have somebody like Prince who is is or the for, or the artist formerly known as or the now deceased I suppose. Prince has died, right? The the now deceased artist formerly, formerly known, known as, as Prince. Prince. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm 90% sure Prince is dead. I are you you he is, right? Were you saying he I, I I'm skeptical. Uh, oh, I feel see. his you, presence. I see. I see what you're saying. I, I I'm 90 percent sure at some point in the recent uh, history, some it was reported that Prince is dead. But I it occurs to me sometimes I think people are dead or not. Yes, his his date of death was in 2016. This is what it, that's what I was saying. Uh, uh, what is it? Just that they just take their hands off completely and go, yeah, you can still be sexually provocative. You can still, or was there was there nothing about? him and Serena Williams and others, uh, n newly Serena Williams, is there nothing there that um, they are getting away with that usually they wouldn't? So Serena Williams was a, a slightly different situation, and I'm, I'm fascinated to see how things play out there because she was if like a believing Jehovah's Witness for, I don't know, decades. Uh, she was raised in a Jehovah's Witness family, 
but she wasn't baptized. And, and because she wasn't baptized, she wasn't subject to all of the rules that Jehovah's Witnesses have to follow if they're to not get disfellowshipped or, you know, not get shunned as bad association. So she basically had the best of both worlds. And then just recently, like a few weeks ago, she got baptized uh, for the first time. Um, I think you guys had her on the Super Bowl advertising, what was it, Budweiser and let's, something else. Let's be careful with that um, phrase, you guys. I don't even know who you're grouping sorry. me in, but I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> America uh, had the, had like the Super grouping. Bowl recently. And um, and apparently Serena Williams was seen in some of the halftime adver adverts or something. But, you know, that, that sort of stuff was probably filmed before her baptism. It's going to be really, really interesting to see to what extent they rein her in now that they actually can. Um, with Prince, my understanding is that he was baptized, um, but for whatever reason, they managed to give him quite a bit of latitude with, as you say, um, he was still producing, you know, albums kind of right up to the end, wasn't he? Um, it not makes that you I followed wonder, his music that much. Yeah. It makes you wonder if if they if Prince uh, at the time actually even recognized what religion he was in. If if in his mind his the version of uh, Jehovah's Witnesses is good is what he does. I, fuck, what am I trying mm -hmm. to say? Like. Like it's, it is okay to be sexual. It is okay. And so when people come at him and they're like, Hey, this is terrible. They're sexually oppressive calling. He's like, well, look at me. I'm out here. I'm gyrating my hips talking about whatever. Uh, uh, I mm. couldn't quote a Prince song to you. It's been a long time since I've listened, but, uh, uh, part of the why I wasn't sure he was dead or not, but yeah, it's, it's, yeah. I, I don't know. You take that as, well, this is what I was saying before. I, I, everyone has kind of different experiences and, um, I, it wouldn't surprise me if if Prince had a had a version of the Jehovah's Witness religion in his head that you know isn't what's actually printed in the literature. I, I say this a lot on the channel that you know you can come up with your own versions of of the religion that kind of make sense in your head and make it less culty and less doomsday, but that doesn't affect what's actually being printed in the literature. You know. Good sure. for you for coming up with a, a more palatable version, but that doesn't wash with, you know, explaining away this stuff. Uh, we can only really comment on what the leaders themselves are saying. And if the leaders themselves are coming out with doomsday, hateful, uh, homophobic claptrap, then that's what we need to be talking about. Yeah. Uh, the, the, it also makes me wonder whether or not people like, I, I remember seeing years ago, people bringing the idea of like Xenu and shit to John Travolta and John Travolta seeming, I bet he's an actor, so who knows, but seeming very genuinely, like, I have no idea what you're talking about. That's not what, this isn't a part of my, and it makes you wonder whether or not he was being genuine in that moment where, whether or not it was like, there's other examples out there too, like uh, the church of Christ famously, you can't listen to pop music. You know, who's a member of the church of Christ, weird Al Yankovic. There's no way Weird Al Yankovic could, I, it, it, like to me, even just the way he expresses himself, there's no way he is having the Church of Christ experience from Church of Christ mm. and and doing what he does. I just don't know what what must be being said there. The John Travolta one's an interesting one. I know that with Scientology, you have to go like a few levels up the bridge. Is it like OT3 before you learn about Xenu. So maybe when he was questioned about Xenu, he just genuinely hadn't done that particular part of the bridge yet. Um, or maybe he had done it and he just kind of forgotten about it. Hey, that'd be <laughs> a lot know, to forget. I, I, just, I mean, he had the money to I go just, up the ladder. Yeah. yeah. Well, what they do apparently, I, I, I'm, I'm told, is that on OT, it, I think it's OT3, it could be like a higher level, but they take you in a room and they they open like a briefcase and they show you like a document that talks about the Xenu thing. Yeah. And then after, it's not like you can kind of take a photocopy at home, photocopy home and study it and, and ponder on it and think about it. You, you just have like a moment with this document that Hubbard once wrote and then that's it sort of thing. So it wouldn't surprise me if even Scientologists who have been through that level, because you know, the human mind's a really fascinating thing, isn't it? I mean, 
cognitive dissonance gets you to all sorts of weird realities where you can be in just total denial of of something that has literally been spelled out to you like for example the fact that all non-jehovah's witnesses will die at armageddon and yet you can still convince yourself oh well it's not quite that black and white god's going to read hearts and yeah. ultimately he's going to be the judge which isn't the teaching but people convince themselves that it is so i think cognitive din- dissonance goes a long way to explaining why he could have been confused yeah yeah it's def- it's very interesting all right so then so i suspect people like david miscavige knows it's a scam i think he knows i think he's aware that it's not true uh i actually think that at this point we now know so much about what's going on it, among the quorum, we now know so much in Mormonism that I also think that they must know at the top this isn't true. None of us are talking to God. We know our members think we're literally meeting with him often, though we won't directly confirm or deny that. Membership generally it believes we are meeting with God in temples and stuff. Uh, and I think they must know there at the top that it's bullshit. So then the question extends to with. Jehovah's Witnesses and your council, you said it's 10 members, right, of the of the governing body? Yeah. Do you think they know or do you think they think they're actually living the leadership of a genuine religious movement, cult, whatever you want to call it? I, I was asked this on the channel very recently, and um, my answer is that I think I genuinely think it's complicated. I mean, again, I, I haven't I, I don't know as much about the LDS Church as you know, obviously, and uh, ditto Scientology, although Miscavige seems like a fairly egregious example of, of, of a charlatan and, sure. and a con man. Yeah. Um, but with, with with the governing body, I, I really think it's it's at least a bit nuanced. I think that um, the, the longer you're in it, and bear in mind some of these guys have been in it for like decades, you know, imagine what it's like to be a governing body member. You're you're living for years and and decades in an environment where every room you walk into or every corridor you walk down, you are surrounded by fawning followers who are telling you that you're special, who are telling you that you are part of of God's channel with mankind. I, you're not telling me that after a while that doesn't start to rub off on you. So I think that the like the likelihood of a governing body member being cynical probably would increase the more recently they've been appointed, which is why Mark Sanderson concerns me. Um, and there's been like three appointments since Mark Sanderson. I think if I were to guess, those guys who've kind of risen up the ladder fairly quickly and who all bar one have have worked in the service department, which is where the real skeletons are kept, where they uh, keep the the database of child abusers. Um, if I had to guess, those are the ones who are probably the most cynical and sort of the, the dinosaurs that have been in the organization for decades, who've just led this incredibly um, kind of <laughs> weird life of, of just being receiving non-stop adulation for decades, I think there's there's probably going to be more genuine delusion in, in the older group than in the more recent group. Yeah. I, uh, it's interesting. I, I, are there within, and I've got a couple more calls. We'll jump on them here in a second, but are, are yeah. within the church or within Jehovah's witnesses, do you all also get stories of, um, them basically performing miracles that these are like d- ethereal miracle workers. Cause with us, with the quorum, it's, there's always those sort of myths and legends that surround them. And then all of the, uh, the speaking in tongues, which the Mormon version is that they were, they were speaking to a group of multi-language people and everyone heard them in their native tongue, even though they were speaking English. Uh, we hear that sort of, heard that sort of shit all the time. Uh, anything similar? They don't call it miracles, they call it Jehovah's Hand. And um, it started off with some, I wouldn't call them impressive, but at least um, some theatrical examples of Jehovah's Hand, one of which was, we hey, we were renovating a, 
a kingdom hall on this island. I think it was Yap in the Pacific. And wouldn't you know, we needed some sand. And there was this tornado. And the tornado washed up a whole bunch of sand on the beach that we needed to build our kingdom hall. Um, and they kind of gloss over the fact that this same uh, tornado actually killed people and yeah. um, caused yeah. millions of dollars worth of damage to property. So that was one example. But more recent examples have been as uninspiring and underwhelming as, hey, we were building this um, branch extent extension or this new facility in this country and we were unsure as to whether we would get a building permit. And you know, we got a building permit. It must have been Jehovah's Hand. <laughs> so, it, it, you know, as time's dragging on, these examples of quote unquote miracles are getting less impressive. Yeah. I, yeah. I agree. I mean, even in the early Mormon days, one of their big miracles is the miracle of the seagulls, which came to eat the, the grasshoppers that were killing crops. Uh, they, you know, the crops were being killed and then. Uh, yeah, it was just, uh, it was just, uh, but am I, as I keep saying on my channel, Jimmy, yeah. you know, what does that say about God? If that's his priority, Sending oh, I'm seagulls. not bothered about the Holocaust. I'm yeah. not bothered about, you know, the millions dying from coronavirus, you know, let's sort out the, this infestation with some seagulls. Yeah. <laughs> you know, do, do you really want to worship that kind of God? You know, I wouldn't, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I feel it. All right, let's say let, let's take this one real quick. We've got uh, Al in Illinois. After this call, we will. Uh, uh, after this call, maybe one more. We'll do the uh, super chat section and then call it a day because I've I've uh, admittedly monopolized time on asking more questions and then uh, than than going on to calls. But uh, Al in Illinois, you are on the line. Great to speak with you both. Uh, big fans. Thanks, Al. Thanks, Al. Yeah. What's your um, question? I, well, I've been a therapist for a while now, and I, uh, I've had my, without revealing too much, my mom. Real quick, Al, uh, are you on speakerphone or anything, or is the phone kind of far from your your mouth? Or you're just coming in quiet for me. Oh, I'm sorry. Is that better? That's night and day better. Way better. Thank you. Oh, great, great. Um. So yeah, I I had uh, a grandmother and a mom that were in uh, basically the Black Muslim or uh, group, the Nation of Islam, and the the insular idea of kind of trying to make of make of your future your own. Uh, within a group is very tantalizing. Um, I, I, I could say a lot about what happened that led a lot of African Americans to that. Um, I, I wonder, uh, coming out of, uh, your respective, uh, your respective religious groups, are there questions that you still have, about like why is it that I still feel this way? Why is it that I, um, why is it that I still uh, worry about certain things? Do you have some residual feelings of like even now, where you kind of wonder why you think or do the things that you do based on what happened uh, in your lives? Should I go first? Yeah, yeah, yeah. After you, I'm, I, I'm, I'm curating yeah. things anyway. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I give an example on my channel of, uh, I think it was in 2020, um, in December, um, woke up one morning, and actually, no, it was it wasn't December. I think it was, I forget exactly when, but it was in 2020, and obviously we were in the middle of the pandemic, and. Um, there was an earthquake in Zagreb, which we felt in Sisak, where we were living. And straight away, without me having any control over it, my brain went straight to, oh, Armageddon. It's like Armageddon bingo. You know, earthquakes, check. Mm. Pestilences, check. And it, it happened really, really quickly in my brain. And 
uh, I was able to almost instantaneously apply logic and reasoning. And no, of course, this is a coincidence. And, you know, of course, there, there are going to be other parts of the world where there aren't earthquakes. And, you know, the pandemic uh, is one of many pandemics and it will pass as the other pandemics have passed. Um, so straight away, I was able to kind of shut down that kind of residual um, cult paranoia. Um, but it, it, it was there for long enough in my brain for me to remember um, having that those thoughts. So, you know, this stuff gets coded into you for sure. And uh, even when you are many years out of it and perhaps you've even dedicated yourself to helping other people out of it, um, it's very, very difficult to get it washed out of every crevice of, of your brain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is the question in summary, because I was doing things, and by the way, Lloyd, I shot you a message in uh, Twitter DMs if, if you could get a second to check okay. it. Okay. Uh, but, uh, but is the question essentially like, do we find ourselves still basically recognizing that there are inherent issues that we were raised in our cult, that there's still things that linger in our brain that we're still working on? Is that... Is that a good summary of the question or is that not even close? Yeah, no, that's perfect. Yeah. So I, I would say there are things I recognize all the time and now I will embrace and just call them out. It, 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 I, I've, you know, I've stopped pretending I, uh, 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 that, that ego doesn't exist in all of us and that mind can be a little bit much to deal with in specific realms. And, and I know that a lot of that comes from the very self-importance of being raised as a Mormon. And I'm like, I am the main character of, of this arc. I mean, I, when I was younger, I was praying to God that I'd be the person who gets to bring forth the, uh, uh, the, the, the sealed portion of the book of Mormon. He would reveal that to me and I'd, I'd be the one who gets to bring it to the masses. The book of Lehi. There's still time, Jimmy. I know there is There's still time. You've got the YouTube presence now. <laughs> there is there. And just, but just the audacity from the onset to go, Hey, you know what the world needs is me as a public figure, my thoughts out there. Uh, uh, and so I've addressed that and I recognize that that's something and it's, it's something I work on, but at the same time, I don't know what improving that looks like. Cause I'm also not going to lose the self-confidence and my ability as a producer and a content creator that objectively has helped people in the way that I'm hoping to help people. And so I'm just trying to drive my priorities. I, I talked about it on the show the other day too. Like, boy, this thing is so sad that were I not still had I not still internalized a specific toxic masculine trait, I'd probably cry right now, but I'm not going to because it would emasculate me. It would undermine my ability to feel like a man right now. Uh, and and so those things are, are definitely there it, over the years, also getting over like super deep purity culture stuff that sometimes you're so you're so anti-purity culture that you can actually loop around and become pro-purity culture again as you are trying to police the sex mm. lives of other people in other ways with different justifications. Uh, I, and I've, I've seen that tremendously amongst activists, unfortunately. Uh, there's, mm -hmm. there's, there's just a lot. I, and I can even remember like early in the pandemic where uh, OnlyFans was taking off, almost having this like negative thought where it'd be like, well, but do, really you, you should be doing OnlyFans. Like, why don't you do stick with that job that you were doing? That's uh, a, a real job and whatever, uh, uh, feeling like little, not, not significant. I just said it in more words than I felt it. It was just an emotion I recognized where I was judging whether or not I should think a person should or shouldn't be doing the real job of OnlyFans and recognize like, uh, this is a gross thing that apparently is still up there in my head. Let's purge that immediately. <laughs> Fuck that shit. Uh, and so, and now I try to do the opposite. I'm, you know, one of the people we have on the channel a lot is, is one of my best friends in the world. And her name is uh, hope. And she has funded her dog shelter, uh, that she runs a, a, a dog shelter. And they at any given times have tons of dogs and they're taking them off of basically doggy death row in Texas. Uh, and she funds it with the money she makes on OnlyFans, Um, and so there's, there's, yeah, getting over these, these things that are, Again, we kind of talked about it earlier. There are these ideas that certain things are inherent uh, uh, and and a lot of things don't go away right away that you thought were inherent. The, the Even just the preciousness of things like sex, you don't really go away right away until, until the day you realize that, like, for some people, it's going to be... I'm certainly the kind of person who I can make love and I can... I can have sex that's, that's as important to me as a handshake. And as long as everybody's on the same page, who gives a fuck? Uh, it's, it's, those are the things that I've had to let go of. Um, 
and and stop treating like let go of uh, from Mormonism that have stuck around. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, I would just the, say, that, okay. sorry for be, for better or worse, ev everything about who we are that's kind of residual from our respective groups. I'm talking about me and Jimmy, you know, yeah. LDS Church, Jehovah's Witnesses. For for better or worse, it's made us who we are. And you know, yeah. if you were to kind of just erase everything about Jimmy that derives from your LDS background, you would no longer be Jimmy. Yeah, you know. Exactly. And the same yeah. thing with me, with my with my kind of weird paranoias and and behavioral traits. So, right. you know, for better or worse, this shit happened, and it's not a case of trying to erase it or or kind of in some way pretend it's not there. It's just a case of making sure it's it's not controlling us in, in an unhealthy way. Yeah, that's that's a good point. I've, I've brought up before, mm. in Mormonism, charisma is the only thing they value you for if you're a man. It's like the only, if you're not a charismatic man, you're basically going to mm. be a background player and you're going to feel like nobody gives a fuck about you. Uh, and I am a deeply non-charismatic natural personality. But as a performance, I have learned because I needed that value. A good performance. And anybody who's ever met me in person will tell you like, oh, yeah, that ain't him, bud. He's a different guy off air. Uh, uh, I, I, you know, I struggle to make eye contact is one of the big things that I rarely talk above a whisper in, in real life because I desperately don't want to be perceived most often. Then sometimes a switch flips uh, uh, like we did a community dinner um, back in December. Uh, and, and at first I was just trying to hide from everyone. Uh, uh, they brought out a smaller table cause our group got too big. And so I was, I, I grabbed Arden and was like, let's go to the, let's go to the kids table. Not literally there weren't any kids, but let's go to the small table. And then at a certain point I flips, uh, a switch flipped and I was like, oh, I'm here to actually do a performance too. And so I'm going to perform to the group in front of me, but one-on-one -on -one conversation devastating. Um, but yeah, you're quite right. There are some Ooh. things that I can credit Mormonism for. And uh, since they abused me so much to, to give me that one benefit, I'm going to now use that thing they gave me uh, against to, to their detriment as they used it to mine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the, the use of one's actual strengths being sort of like chiseled, strengthened uh, strengths that are strengthened um, strengths that are uh, sharpened by the challenges rather than seeing them as being blunted by them. That's, uh, yep. that's a great way for people to learn to decom uh, to decompress and deconvert um, in a way that doesn't just like try to throw the baby out with the bathwater for sure. Sure. Um, I, uh, one last thing, um, sure. I actually have had to whittle down what influence my goal has been for the world, uh, ever since, you know, the kinds of things that I was taught and things that were not completely untrue around me. I grew up in a very impoverished area and I was one of the only young people who actually was going to school and getting scholarships and escaping all of that. And it's easy to attribute that to the God that, you know, is leading people like me out and other people are believing in Christianity and they're, they, they must not be believing in the correct God because that's, that you can see right there, see, they're not, they're not escaping out of it like I am, so mine must be true. Um, and then right when I got uh, two years into college, September 11th happened, and it was like, you know, this Islam thing I think has a few dings in it. I think I should take a step back um, and kind of re realign and see where I am. Um, and from there came this long progression toward atheism. But because of that notion of believing that I was rescued out for a reason while thousands of others in my area weren't, it's taken a long time to say, well, you don't have to change the world just because of that. 
the survivor guilt doesn't need to fuel you. Um, so that's my little, sure. uh, my little thing that, that definitely an activist can, can run into. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Well, um, thank you, Al. I really appreciate the time. Yeah. Thanks for yeah. coming. Have a good one. Thanks for you. Nice to meet you, Al. There was uh, uh, something I said a, a couple weeks ago. Did you ever say something? And well, I don't know that you believe yourself as profoundly stupid as I believe myself to be. But uh, do you ever say oh, I something? Am stupid. Okay, good, good, good. Uh, do you ever say something and you go, "Oh my God, the profundity of what I just said is actually pretty great. It's pretty. That's wow. I just, I just did a wisdom. My goodness. And one of the things that that hit me that way. Look what I've created. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and 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 I'm now I'm going to say it. It's not going to live up to the hype. But for me, it was. I used to have this idea of like, all I want to do is make the world a little better than when I found it. That used to be the thought, and a lot of people have that. But it's impossible. That's an impossible goal. The world is going to be worse than you found it because you are one person and the world is getting worse in a lot of ways. Obviously, there are specific things in ways in which it's getting better. But as far as like it's it is getting worse. Fascism is rising again. Uh, and so now the 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 thing I say is like, forget about making the world worse or better than when you found it. Just make the world better than if you hadn't been alive. It's going to be overall worse, but reduce that worseness by point whatever, zero, 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 whatever percent if you can. I am going to counter that by asking the live chat a simple question. Is Jimmy making the world better? Oh, I can Please poll answer them. Yes or no. Yeah, yeah you them. should poll them. I think is... you'll find the majority will say Jimmy is making the world a better place. So but... sorry, I disagree with you there. I, I, I'm saying on the scale of the world, I can't make the whole world itself better. Well, you don't have but I to. Can make, you don't have exactly. to. You're not Superman. I, that, and that's sort of what I'm saying is I feel like that's what people – if you only focus on <clears throat> I want the world to be better when I die than it was when I found it. That's sort of the overall concept. If you focus on that, you're going to never succeed and you're going to fail at it. And so my thing is I just want the world to be better than it would have been had I not lived in it. Had I not existed at all versus my existing, I want the latter to be better. And it's it's sort of different. But that's because, still you leaving the the world better than you found it in a way, isn't it? Because I, I don't think it is. I I, so it, it's sort of like this. It's sort of like, let's, <laughs> I'm trying to think of like a way to make it a metaphor. Let's say that you do find something that's in decline. Uh, uh, and so you've just got something that's falling. Let's say it's, it's the amount of uh, cheese in the world is declining, right? And, and I become a cheese maker. And so for just a teeny little blip, the amount of decline, it's still declining, but the amount of decline takes a turn away from the trend for this, the, the smallest amount of blip. And when you actually, you actually like move out, you probably can't even see it. Or you look in and you see times where it bumps up and down and it's, and, and a world without cheese is, it's, that's a bad world. Uh, uh, and, and you see dips up and down, but it's still following a trend line. I just want to be a, a part of the bumps that went away from the trend line of less cheese because I became a cheese maker than a person who stayed on the line or blipped it under and made, and made sure there was even less cheese because I murdered a cheese maker. Uh, that's, that's what I mean. Maybe it's just my hunger and, and stomach um, yeah. But I, I'm really struggling to zero in and, and focus on the cheese ma metaphor. Yeah. Um, but I will I will say that you're probably drastically overlooking the the impact that logic and reason and clarity can have in people's lives. I hope so. Um, I, I be, because it really does it really does change things and and it's a generational thing as well. So what one of the things that I most I most love about my work and kind of keeps me doing it is the thought that I can potentially help people who I'll never get to meet or even better I can help someone who won't even know that I've ever helped them because let's say their mother or their father or their grandparents uh, found one of my videos or one of my books helpful that sort of that sort of stuff is profound to me. So yeah. I would say don't sell yourself short and don't underestimate how good you can actually do, how much good you can actually do.
I'm gonna. I I I figured this out because I've got a little. Uh, uh, I got a little Have drawing tablet. No, I do. Yeah. Well, it's it's. I really, am winning. It's not a hard. Uh, it's not a hard one to win. It's it's <laughs> these people will cheer for anything. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'm but there, no, come on. These are your esteemed viewers. I and they agree my with me. My audience is great. I've <laughs> I've curated a great audience and got rid of some of the shit. So the x-axis resembles time, and this is how good is the world. And now I'm gonna draw, I'm gonna draw a line, and I'm gonna say that this this resembles uh the the how good the world is over time. And and we're and there's a lot, obviously there's a lot of things, but you'll notice that right around there. There's a little blip where the line becomes less straight down and it actually deviates from what the average line would be were we to draw the, I can't actually do this mirrored, the average line. And I want that little blip of the quality of decline being slightly slowed to be me. There we go. That's what I'm saying. That, that's, the, that's the sort of graphic that Jehovah's Witnesses would draw, by the way, because they believe that the world is deteriorating and whenever they say that, I always say, when would you rather be living? Would you rather be living now or in 1940? Hey, I don't just... They always uh, say now. I, 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 I get it. I get it. And also, I think the world is getting worse. I think that we are losing... I think humanity may be in its end stages and that the ultimate uh, conclusion is going to be mm. that humanity annihilates itself. Because now, when we do... Like, just the... How how many countries and how many absolute insane people have nuclear arms? How we just are not giving a fuck about these broader pictures when it has to do with climate change? I totally get it. But the and and because I'm the person who would say, of course, I'd rather live now. Uh, especially, I'm so medically dependent on the medical advancements. I'd be dead right now if I were even born perhaps ten years earlier because I've been saved by cutting edge technology. Uh, and if if you asked me. When would I want to live more now or a hundred years from now in the future? I would also say a hundred years in the future, thereby just demonstrating my attachment isn't actually to now in my existence. I am willing to move, but the things that I would move for are advancements in technology. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not convinced a hundred years in the future, you know, actually looks like the future. I don't know how we're going to get through the current fascism versus non-fascism essentially that is rising with more difficulty with more difficulty without people like you is the answer i well for for a minute look here's the other thing 10 years from now there's going to be an ai that does my job way better than me is way more handsome <laughs> way more appealing way more compelling uh there is no job that is safe from ai anybody who thinks their job okay. is safe is insane hey I, i'm game if, if an ai lloyd wants to do my job Please take it. I'm, I'm not going to fight you for it. Yeah. <laughs> by, by the way, I bring that up because I'm actually working on a project. I'm trying to find the right system to do it, but I'm going to make an AI, me debating basically my past Mormon self, and I'm going to use AI to make the video and audio out of my voice. And I'm going to, it's going to be obviously not literally me. I'll be dressed as a Mormon and I'm going to use voice scripting and stuff like that to make this AI, my Mormon debate companion it's gonna be nice gonna i'm be totally fun. watching that totally yeah. watching that yeah i think it'll be good i think it'll be good uh let's uh we're, we're probably gonna have to be a little bit quicker with these but let's talk to austin in colorado where i am from before here anyway i actually now live in austin the the location not the person that would be wild uh but uh i moved from colorado so anyway austin from colorado you're on the line thank you jimmy uh yeah and Coincidentally, I moved from Austin to Colorado. Wild, yeah. <clears throat> Austin, by the way, you are very yeah. <laughs> quiet. Kind of like the. Are you, are we far from the? Oh, are, am I? Yeah. Are we on speakerphone or anything? Can we? Uh... I you are, but I'm about to get off of it, uh, so I'm just trying to because I'm kind of driving in my car. Oh, uh, we have a rule: part. we don't we don't take driving calls because we don't want to be responsible for somebody's <laughs> death. As unlikely, how uh, how oh, quickly no. can you pull I'm over? Like, oh, I'm like literally at my house right now. Okay, good. Good, good. All right. I'll, I apologize for that. No worries. Yeah, we don't ever want to... staying on the line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. We don't, we don't ever want to risk it. What was your question, though? Can you hear me better now? Tremendously better. What's your question? Awesome. So my question is more so in uh, directed at Lloyd, just with when it comes to, you know, after he 
you know, exited the Jehovah's Witness religion, what was it that kind of inspired him, you know, or influenced him to do what he's doing, you know, to do this activism work? Because, you know, there's a part of me that is very much so driven, you know, to want to do these things. But I also have family, you know, and various responsibilities, you know, in my life. And so to hear the perspective of somebody who's been in a somewhat similar situation as me and and how they did it is, is kind of something that I'd really like to hear more of, basically. Wow. Well, that's a very generous question. Thank you. Um, uh, what was it that made me get involved in activism? It wasn't like a conscious decision, if I'm being honest. It was like a, a journey, yeah. and I would, you know, just take put one put one foot in front of the other and do it step by step. And, you know, fairly early on in my awakening process from or my deprogramming process, you know, I was basically verbalizing my doubts and my research online on on forums, right. and you know, from forums it went to posting blog articles, and from blog articles it, it went to posting videos on YouTube, but in such a way that I couldn't be identified, and from there it went to full on blogging. So it was very much like a, a step by step process where it's like not only am I realizing that this is all a load of nonsense but maybe I have a way of communicating what I'm learning that is not so much unique but um, it's people other people are deriving benefits from it and, and then what you get is is kind of like this dopamine transaction where you know you you're getting a kick from people expressing that that they enjoy your way of explaining things, you know? And I actually yeah, absolutely. think, that, yeah, I think a lot of ex-cult members go through that sort of rush of of feeling like they, they're contributing and they really are contributing. Um, and then what tends to happen in, in the majority of cases I've noticed is that they kind of just disappear because, you know, they've they've received kind of the... Uh, closure and catharsis that that they needed right um, exactly but it, in and my, that's literally in what my I own people case. are thinking about is we don't have enough representation uh, yeah you know we've got people like you doing this you know but you're you're over on the other side of the hemisphere you know i'm in america and you know i can't think of anybody in america that does any kind of JW, JW activism work like what you do. And, you know, and that's not just JW activism. I just think of atheism stuff too. And it's like, uh, you know, I'm huge fans of, of what Jimmy does and what you do and, and people like Matt Dillahunty. And all I can think of is, you know, well, who's going to take their place? How do, how do we have, yeah. you know, things set in place so that, we can continue to broaden our horizons and broaden the accessibility to this information so that people can get more and more of, you know, the great benefits of what we bring when we try to pose the, the, the other side of the coin, basically. Well, um, June Talon in the live chat has, has just said, you know, Owen Morgan, question mark. Yeah, I love you know that there are there are others and you know I, I'm very very flattered by what you've said about myself and Jimmy but you know truthfully you know we are we are by far the only channels that deal with either atheism or cults or Jehovah's Witnesses or uh, Latter-day Saints Church it's it's lovely that you know my content resonates with you in in, in kind of a special way um, but I, I'm very heartened by the fact that there are many others doing this. Yeah. And I, I like to think that it's kind of like a baton situation, like a relay race where, you know, we have our moment, Jimmy and I, to, to use what talents we have to uh, help people towards logic and reason. And the next generation will come and they will take the baton from us. It, it's just inevitable. And when that time yeah. comes, 
um, will, will either still be alive and we'll get to see it happen, or we, or for whatever reason, we won't be. But um, this is an ongoing struggle, and we are all standing on the shoulders of giants, and there will be giants following us. You can be sure of that. Yeah, Austin. I know the question yeah. wasn't directed to me, but I do have a I, I I have a couple of thoughts anyway, and I'm an egotistical dick, yeah. so I'm going to answer it anyway. Uh, the, so so to the to the question of like the other people and and people who are out there. I look first of all as far as like this channel goes, I would say this is more of a skepticism channel than an atheism channel. And I've actually gotten to the point where I True. give a, yeah. I, I don't give a fuck about the word atheist. Now, when people say like, "Oh, well, then are atheists rocks that are trying to have, or are rocks atheists when they're trying to have that philosophical discussion?" I go, "Sure," because that's how much my atheism matters to me. It's literally, that's right. how much I think that word fucking matters. Uh, uh, yeah, right. yeah, Ath rocks are atheists. I don't give a fuck. Uh, uh, this is more, I, I would say this is a skepticism channel and, uh, you know, I would go out on a limb and say that specific to skepticism, it's, it's really the best channel in the world. Anyway, besides, <laughs> but, but there, that doesn't mean there, there are great channels that cover great categories too. Uh, if you want to talk about discourse and psychology, I think that Shannon Q is almost unbeatable in that realm. Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. I comes follow to Shannon Q. For sure, yeah. Sure, it comes to evolution and talking about where evolution and the education about evolution and skepticism and stuff comes in. You've got a couple of choices there. Aaron Ra is sort of a steel man debater when it comes to that. Uh, and Forrest oh, is yeah. has a type of charisma and happiness and accessibility that like, like uh, uh, Aaron's who you yeah. go to when I you're coming to them. fight. I follow, I follow you, I sure. follow Aaron, I follow... Forest, uh, I've been following you guys for for many years now, basically, and that's kind of what. Yeah, and as a know, practice, Austin, like now I'm not I'm like, not trying to tell you you don't. Uh, if this is more now, I'm going to take the opportunity to promote all the people that I think people should be oh, listening yeah, to. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so I'm going to finish. Let me, let me. I'm gonna, I, I, I got more to go. Uh, uh, Arn's the Arn's the go guy ahead. you go to fight. Uh, Forrest is the guy you go to when you're ready to learn. Though uh, Arn also makes incredible educational content. The best anti-apologetics channel on the planet, I think, is Apology. I think as far as general Christian apologetics, I don't think anybody beats him. Uh, I hope that mm -hmm. I have a good core contribution, and I think you'll see that the Jimmy Snow channel is going to focus a lot more on Mormon stuff in the in the future, as well as, but also some political stuff, especially when next year comes around, we're in the presidential thing. Uh, uh, obviously, you yeah. have Owen and you have Lloyd when it comes to XJW stuff. Uh, and 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 they're they're just these groups of they're also underrated channels. And this is one of the things that we're trying to solve on the line. Like as far as ex Mormon mm -hmm. content goes, Zelf on the Shelf is my favorite channel. It's not my it's not my skepticism channel. The line's my favorite channel, even though that's my baby. But when it comes to Mormon stuff, Zelf on the Shelf, they're the shit. I just fucking love those two. But we've also been talking to other creators yeah. who are amazing, like Exmo Lex, like Nuance Ho, uh, these people whose voices are are so tremendous. And so. Uh, I will tell you that when you, if you're sitting and you're worried about, you're anxious about one day, Jimmy's not going to be here. One day, Matt's not going to be here. One day, Lloyd's not going to be here. Who's going to be there in their place. I know that uh, I can't speak for Lloyd because we haven't discussed a specific thing, but Matt and I perfectly platform per purposefully platform people for that reason. We're telling you who we hope right. is next. Uh, and by the way, yeah. there's a lot of people who think I'm the, I'm Matt's replacement that that comes up a lot. Uh, Matt, I will quit before Matt does. I just want to set that expectation. The moment I can be 100% <laughs> behind the scenes production, you'll never see me again, right. ever. I don't yeah. like being a public figure. I don't, I, I like, I like making videos. I like to having an audience. I like talking yeah. and stuff, but there's a lot to being a public figure. I despise. And so the moment I can be and that's most my, powerful I mean, as a producer, too. that's what I worry about. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's what I worry about too. You know, it's it's like trying to find your calling, and that's kind of why I was asking Lloyd. You know, yeah. because he does have a family. I have a family too. Um, you know, I lost pretty much everybody when I left, all of my friends and family, and so it was literally just me and my wife, and you know, our kids. And so, Austin, I've got a lot of responsibilities on my on my end. But sure, Here's that was my... just something that I was curious. Here's my question for you, Austin. Do you feel like your voice? is missing on YouTube or on wherever these things are. And I, it, it sounds like a, it's not in any way a trick question or meant to make you be egotistical. Cause that's the reason I became one. My voice was right. missing the way I internalize information, the way I explain information. I'd already interacted with a lot of people uh, and realized that question simply. Uh, yes. Yes. I would, I would say so. So if, if you feel like, and it's, and you can do so safely and you feel like the absence of your voice 
is it basically like that your voice added to everything will make it better, will will hit people's ears in a way that people aren't hitting their ears right now, then I highly recommend you give it a <laughs> shot. But you have to keep your safety yeah. uh, uh, in, as priority, for sure. Right, yeah, especially. Yep. And that is definitely one of my other concerns because I don't know enough uh, when it comes to that aspect of the world, when it comes to you know putting yourself on the various forms that it could be. And so I'm kind of... Yeah. You know, while I'm trying to get my shit together, I'm also tentatively trying to look around at my different options and see, you know, what what would fit for me, basically. If I can't be a public figure and, you know, put my face on a screen, it's like, well, maybe then I can do call-in shows or something else, write yep. a book, whatever. I know I've got options, but those are just those things that I'm trying to consider because, you know, yes, to your question. And, and I really do feel like in general, you know, here we are years later, you know, and it's not like Lloyd isn't still answering the same questions that people ask about Jehovah's Witnesses. Why? Because yeah. there's so much misinformation. There's so much propaganda that these religions pump out, you know, <laughs> sure. like Austin, some we of need that... more voices to kind of wade through all of that crap and help people see it's like, yeah, yeah, just because somebody says this doesn't mean that that's the reality. Sure. This is what people do. This is what people actually say and think, you know, take it from somebody who spent 30 years giving talks and, and sitting, you know, listening to all of this. Yeah. 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 No, I think it's a good point. A good point. Any other questions before we let you go, Austin? Uh, no, not really. Well, I mean, I could go on for hours. I'd love to okay, talk we don't, to you guys, but, we, uh, we don't have hours. Unfortunately, <laughs> we got to get the super chats thing done here and I've got at least one no, caller. I want to do a quick I love thing you guys. With. Thanks. I'll take care. Thank Austin, you thanks so much for calling. Really appreciate it. Definitely. Bye-bye. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye. Uh, I was, I was gonna say on that, on that topic of, um, answering the same questions over and over again, I, it used to annoy me and now I'm happy to, cause I'm recognizing that it's not that. It's not that they couldn't find that, but first of all, the algorithm's not perfect. If, if every time someone asked me about Pascal's Wager, the algorithm was giving them my Pascal's Wager video first and they ignored it, then I'd be pissed off. But we're we're answering yeah. questions not when we're there in the journey. We're asking, asking questions when the person we're talking to is there in the journey. Yeah. And I'm, I'm fine with having it be a fresh, updated conversation thousands of times a week. Uh, or it's not thousands, but uh, hundreds of times uh, a month, we'll say. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to keep having these conversations over and over and over again because it's about who's in that point in their adventure, both the caller or the person I'm talking to or the audience. That's who it's about. It's not about what annoys me. Yeah, I, I repeat the same stuff over and over and over again on my channel, and yeah. I, I'm not even guilty about it anymore because just because other people have heard it and just because I, I know it doesn't mean that someone that's tuning into the channel first time has heard it before. Sure. So you, you can't anticipate what your audience knows when you're doing this. So the best you can do is just try and come up with imaginative ways of saying the same thing in a slightly different way, but yeah. never never presuppose that people have heard your arguments before. Yeah. yeah. And refresh your metaphors. This time I use cheese. Next time I'll use Tabasco or something. I don't know. You know, you, you can you can still have a little bit of fun, a little, be, be a little creative with things. Uh, yeah. All Keep right, them we'll, cheesy, we'll, yeah. We had, I'm not kidding, as we hung up, I said we're going to get to this next caller, and I think that scared that next caller, and the caller hung up. Uh, and so we'll just pop on. We're already at two hours of a show, so we'll just pop out these Super Chats real quick and then... Uh, Call it a day. So the way we end every show, uh, except for the Sunday show, the Sunday show has a little Chiron that updates Super Chats. But most shows, uh, we read out the Super Chats. We do a little Super Chat Q&A. If you send a chat of $5 or more, it will most likely be read on air. Uh, unless you, you know, are trying to stir some shit or whatever. Uh, if you want to stir some shit, we're going to need some, at least $500 minimum. Uh, uh, and, and through a Venmo, million I think. Dollars. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. It's, and, and even then we might still go now, nah, this one's not worth it. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, but send in your super chats now. It helps us to be able to do shows like this on the line, which are less of the more consistent where everybody's expecting the same thing, um, where we get to introduce you to new people. 
uh, next week on Hostility. I have, I know. Oh, I'm bringing back Alyssa Lubacek, the uh, uh, the the sex counselor. Uh, we'll have a very sexy episode of uh, uh, Hostility. God, I can't remember the name of my own fucking show. Uh, we'll have a very sexy episode of Hostility again next week uh, with Alyssa Lubacek returning, which is. I'm so, so very, very excited. Uh, so, yeah, send in those Super Chats now, and we'll do those, and then the show will be over. So the show the show can go on if you extend it. Quagma TV asks, what cultural myths and legends do Mormons and JWs have, if any? Uh, well, the Cain Where do being, we begin? Cain being Bigfoot. I think they're looking for, like, some more of the sillier ones, I imagine. Cain being Bigfoot is technically culturally reinforced. They never said the name Bigfoot in the story where the the old prophet meets Cain, and Cain is, you know, cursed and covered in fur and uh, as tall as himself on the back of a horse. He doesn't actually call him Bigfoot. So the, the Cain being alive and looking like Bigfoot, that's canon, but actually being Bigfoot... Uh, I suppose is a cultural myth. Got any fun ones like that? There's there's loads. Um, Jehovah lives in the Pleiades constellation. That's an old one from the literature. Mm -hmm. um, there's Beth Sarim and the ancient worthies. They used to believe that before Armageddon, uh, a range of Bible characters, including Moses and Samson uh, and David, would emerge out of thin air and would help to start establishing a government on earth that would administer God's messianic kingdom on the earth. So, um, and Joseph Rutherford even deeded his property, his like mansion in San Diego, Beth Sarim to, he actually named the Bible characters in the deeds of the, of the property. So there's all sorts of stuff. Once you go down the rabbit hole, when it comes yeah. to myths and legends that have, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess we've got, you know, Jackson County, Missouri. That's the Garden of Eden in Mormon Church. Missouri. Yeah. Is the physical location. Which makes sense, I guess. Nope. You yeah. ever been to Missouri? <laughs> it ain't no Eden, I'll tell I you that much. Been. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's is have you been to the US? I think you have. I've been to Texas, to all all up the western seaboard, and I've yeah. been New York State, Delaware, Maryland. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You've been around. Yeah. Well, if you ever mm. want to go to Missouri, don't. <laughs> that's, <laughs> okay. That's my, that's my best <laughs> advice. I'll take uh, a recommendation. Yeah. Okay. That's right. That's right. Uh, only a couple left, everybody. If you want, uh, if, if we want to get the, um, uh, you know, the show can end whenever you want it to end. Uh, too Young to Feel This Old says, I'm all for calling JW's Mormons and Kent Hovind's followers cults. The more I learn and the longer I've been out of religion, I'm still not convinced that all Christianity isn't a cult as well. Thoughts? Go fuck yourself, Jimmy. That's By the way, that's a compliment on my channel. It's, it's, a, it's sort of an okay. inside joke. The, when you see the fuck yous and okay. stuff, it's, it's a nice thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, you want to um, start on this? I, we, you and I probably have a slightly different I know we do. take on this. Um, yep. Yeah. So I, I, I view all religions as being like on a, on a spectrum of cultiness. Sure. And that I think agree. that um, I think that kind of Catholicism and uh, and Anglic Anglicanism and that kind of thing could be considered like a soft cult. And you know, Jehovah's Witnesses, Westboro Baptists going all the way through to, I don't know, um, Islamic extremism, uh, you could consider uh, extreme cults. So, um, yeah, that, that, I, I have a slightly different, you know, definition of, of cult. Uh, yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, I, I tend to, yeah. as far as if I'm formally discussing the cultiness of a cult, usually I'm, I'm referencing something mm. like the bite model or just not like the bite model, the bite model. Uh, but on top of that, when we're talking about breaking down cults and the problems that cults face, I definitely have seen times where you are reluctant to call, I'm not going to say anything specific, but call certain groups of people or organizations that don't fit within this greater fame framework uh, to call cults that I will, that I, I actually think mm -hmm. one of the things that is ruining society and polite existence amongst each other are what you might call uh, extremist uh, extremist internet uh, uh, micro clicks or some shit like that, um, where yeah. where you see the the parallels that they have to a cult are 
the things that it's like, even if the cult doesn't have almost anything else, if it has this, like its ability to, uh, its authoritarian nature, its demand of behavior, uh, its, its, um, uh, the way it will group up and mob and judge just on the basis that you have been othered. Those things mm. in their extreme can, uh, I think in isolation be, um, be cults. And, and and so I will refer to like, I'm not going to refer to veganism keeps coming up on my channel recently because of recent developments. So I don't think most vegans are cults. In fact, I platform vegans all the time, but there are specific micro clip clicks of vegans that are so extremist, so definitive, so othering, so black and white thinking, so authoritarian that I am definitely going to give them at minimum a sort of colloquial cult designation with it being a, a, a difference without a difference in phrase without much of a difference in definition where it's like actually from the perspective of are you as a human performing the psychologically damaging to yourself and other thing that I was when I was in a cult. And yes, I would, I would say they are. It's the, the distinguishment is, is, uh, is, not huge. And so in, in fighting cults, I extend beyond just the religious cults and recognize uh, for myself. I feel like I'm recognizing that cults aren't going away. They're moving. Yeah. And that's, that, that's really important to acknowledge that, it, it, you know, you, you don't have to be religious to be a cult. You know, you could yeah. be a psychotherapy cult. You could be um, an, an MLM. You could be a political cult. Uh, you can take you can take the cult dynamic and the the methods of manipulation and apply them in almost any sphere. Yeah, I, I guess whenever you're whenever you see me kind of shy away from using the c word, it's yeah. not necessarily because I don't think it's a cult. It's more because I remember what it was like to hear that word as a cult member, and you know, ultimately we're talking about a pejorative. Sure. And uh, if, if I'm if I'm tr if I'm interested in persuading someone or reaching through to them, I'm not necessarily going to reach for those words per se. So I can I can think it, but whether I'll say it is another matter entirely. <laughs> I think also you yeah. can a lot of times you can fix it with language, not by just saying like yeah. "shut up, you fucking cult" or whatever. To say like "hey, you're operating like a cult operates" is quite a bit different, yeah. and, and I try to be more yeah. careful with language, but. I'm also entirely human. It's my biggest flaw uh, in my humanity. I There are times I troll for the sake of trolling because I think something's funny or silly, especially on Twitter where it's not real life and everybody mistakes it for real life. Uh, and life's too short. You've got to speak your truth while you can. Yeah, well, yeah. you know, recently, because we, we actually litigated this issue on this channel, Recently speaking, my truth was seeing someone pearl clutch over a meme, so I a, a pervy meme about Jesus. So I responded, "This is offensive. God is a uh, uh, God is a twink who likes cum cum in his tum tum." I saw um, that. I saw that. Yeah. Yeah, and there was there was a bit of and me and the guy that it was between actually we squashed the beef because if a person wants to come to me as a person in real life, I I can squash beef with almost anybody. Almost anybody. There are lines, uh, uh, but but. The 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 aftermath of not just the but pearl you did, clutching. You did it in a comedic way. You did it in a way that yeah. was genuinely funny. I, I could imagine someone else do it in a way that actually isn't funny and just makes the situation worse. So it I, helps to have a sense of humor when you. What yeah. does the word funny mean, though? You know what I mean? Like. <sighs> Yeah, it's, it's subjective. Yeah, <laughs> I assure you, every joke I make, I find hilarious. Uh, and yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, that's the only audience I ever seem to be catering to. And luckily, there's a demographic of people who agree with the singular audience I'm targeting. Well, it's Jimmy Funny. No, we're not. On the live chat. <laughs> that one, that <laughs> one has the potential to hurt my feelings too much. I'm not doing okay, that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that one I'd, I'd internalize poorly. Um anyway, uh Eddie Dean says, off to the gym, love you, love you, but probably meant to say both. From the hashtag blinder gang. I don't know what that means. Blinder gang. Do you know that one? Nope, not heard it, but I have a great time at the gym. I hate the gym. I so despise exercising for the sake of exercising. Uh it's why like 
Well, it's not why, but it's one of the nice things about being a woodworker. If I'm ever like, all right, I, I'm, you know, I'm getting a little, getting a little soft. I need to harden up. I can just take on an extra yeah. project and woodworking. You don't need to go to the gym if you're a woodworker, unless you're making just like little, yeah. little bowls or whatever. But I make furniture and shit, and so I, God, I yeah. hate the exercising for the sake of exercising is fucking miserable. I I do go to the gym but it's been made very much easier by the fact that one opened literally over the road from me so i have that i can helps. just kind of fall out of bed into it and i have my own little routine and i mix it up and i go on different machines and i make it fun for me but i can understand why it's a terrible thing for other people yeah i'll tell you this i uh i lived in an apartment complex for a, like a year and nine months in denver that had its own gym and I only ever entered the gym when giving a tour to people who were visiting of, of the place where it's like, oh, and here's the gym. Uh, sometimes if you parked on one side of the here's building. the forbidden realm. Yeah. Sometimes if you parked on one side of the building, it was faster to cut through the gym to get to the good elevator. And so that also would have been a time I, I went to the gym. Um, okay. Yeah. It's just. Uh, anyway. We've got Liv uh, wrote at Lloyd, why do you think there is such a divide between, uh, I don't know what this means, so I'm just going to say dead-assed and faded, uh, D-A'd dead and faded. Asked. Shouldn't we be supporting one another rather than arguing about it? I don't know what this, this one means. Yeah. Okay, let me decipher this for you. So D-A'd means disassociated and faded so it it's kind of this this dilemma that oh. ex-jehovah's witnesses have uh, it's basically do i crash out do i go out all guns blazing and do i formally sever my ties with the organization by disassociating kind of in protest or do i fade uh, in other words just kind of disappear melt into the background like that kind of homer simpson gif and um and just kind of go off the radar so that elders don't know where i am so that i can still maintain my my ties with my family and this provokes it can provoke quite heated debate on sure. like forums and reddit and what have you and i i really don't have a horse in it i i think yeah. that um you know every situation is different you shouldn't shame people who choose to do whatever they can to maintain their family ties because mental health is actually quite can be quite a fragile thing and if if you need your life to be a certain way for for your life to work for you who the hell does anyone else think they are to tell you otherwise so sure um it's it, it's unfortunate in the ex jehovah's witness community that it is so divided we've seen an example on the show of how twisted ex jehovah's witnesses can be um but unfortunately that's what cults do to people they yeah. they mess with people and they they create unfortunately a lot of damage and that man that manifests itself in different ways but um no one should feel shamed if they resolve a certain situation in a way that works for them i uh i i like that yeah there we we talked about this a little bit um not that specific thing, but the way when you leave the church, whether or not there's a big, there's a big movement to try and do this. Like, well, oh, why can't, why can't people who leave the church just shut up about it? And it's literally like, mm. this is, you are your presumption. You have to presuppose when you say that, that we're leaving for not valid reasons, because if we're leaving for valid reasons, which I argue we would, it doesn't, it, if the church isn't true, it make, makes it a tremendous scam doing a ton of harm. If it is yeah. true, it's still doing harm. It's just not a scam. Uh, and that God just still sucks. But if it isn't true, it's a scam. And to go like fucking Christ, I dedicated my life and personality and very being essence, humanity to uh, perpetuating a scam. The idea that you might respond to that or react to that is going, I don't. I want to I want to help other people have the same revelation I had as quickly as possible. Uh, that's not an unnatural thing. One can say there's even sometimes nobility in it, especially if you do it for non-selfish reasons, unlike myself, uh, who just likes to hear my voice, my, myself talk. Not literally my voice. I hate editing my videos, but boy, is it a treat when I'm just out loud and talking and there are going to be people who don't at all think I'm being sarcastic right now. Well, be you're like, making resources available. 
yeah. you're, you're not dragging people onto onto your channel. You're exactly. making information available for those who need it. And as long as your mm. information is is factual and makes logical sense, why why would I knew it says more about the person who's saying shut up than yeah. it does about you, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 No, I think you're right. There, but there's humility in what you said. There's no humility here. I don't know how I can be an atheist when clearly I'm a god. Anyway, moving <laughs> on. <laughs> I'm gonna go Kanye on everybody. I, would I am get a god. So screwed over by the XJW community if I said some of the things you say. So yeah, I know. So I, oh no, no, no. People do take me seriously and do say that that's what I'm saying and shit. Again, I genuinely have embraced. In years past, if somebody, if especially at my peak, if somebody had accused me of being egotistical, I'd be like, no, I'm not. Da, 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 da. I'm not going to accept some some fucking armchair person who is calling me a narcissist. I, I I'm going to say mm. I am objectively not a narcissist, but that's because of things I know and my interaction with therapy that not everybody needs to know. But if I used yeah. to be so defensive when someone would say I was egotistical, and I was like, I'm making a living talking, which is my yeah. favorite thing to do. How could how how could I have ever gone my words should be broadcasted to the world and not have had some sort of egotistical thing? So it's a matter of what what ego actually is and the concept of I don't think I'm better than anybody else. In fact, I am constantly jealous of everyone who seems to be like in relationships and and happy about things that just don't make me happy. I'm tremendously envious of this has been this is actually shown when people have come to me for relationship advice lately. Um, I'll give them my advice and then tell you, but I want to remind you I am 32 and single. So yes, I think it would be stupid for you to move in with your your significant other after five months of dating. That sounds so stupid to me. But you know what? I'm living with no one. Maybe people who do stupid things like that find the love of their life sooner. I don't know. Maybe that's the key. So what I think is stupid, you should take with a grain of salt because I am so very alone. Uh, and I don't know. I think there's a way to balance all of those things and go like, fuck yeah, man, I'm dope. And I do dope shit, which is an old Kanye line. I like, but, I like quoting Kanye in my egotistical <laughs> rants specifically. And saying secular. Um, but yeah. seriously, I, I think that it's the most tedious criticism you could level as a content creator. Oh, he, he loves the sound of his own voice. Look at how egotistical he is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, name all the channels that you absolutely love and can't get enough of where yeah. the presenter is really sheepish and shy yeah. and, hate, and, hate and can't bring themselves to get... Of yeah. course, the YouTube creators <laughs> that are the most successful and have the biggest platform are going to feel comfortable in front of the camera and project yeah. confidence. That's just inevitable. So that's the most tedious criticism. I'm, I'm so over that. But also, I love, I get a sense of joy when I get called a narcissist uh, in a comment because I'm like, yeah, you're right, man. I'm a narcissist for having the audacity to advocate for myself and argue for my beliefs and put on the best goddamn call-in show on, the, on YouTube. Uh, I was going to say on the planet, but LBC is pretty fucking good, uh, especially James O'Brien. Uh, James O'Brien's just... Hey, yeah. Fucking, he's amazing. Yeah. Again, how can yeah. I be an atheist when that dude's a god? Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> he's so good at it. I'm never going to be as good. But yeah. the the fu the joy of seeing somebody call you a narcissist specifically in in uh, an, a, a th comment section is like, yeah, man. Oh, God, I do such self-involved, full of myself things. Like the other day, I was watching a person who I don't know personally, and I don't have any training uh, to be a therapist or certainly a psychiatrist. I am incapable of diagnosing anyone. And you know what I did from my chair to this person I wasn't treating or qualified to diagnose? I diagnosed him with narcissis narcissistic personality disorder. Like, oh, you want to talk about an inflated sense of self-important? Every single person who actually thinks they are diagnosing narcissists, you can say something seems narcissistic, and I'm not going to say, but if you are sure that someone you are not qualified to diagnose with narcissism mm -hmm. is a narcissist and also someone you're not treating, which this is why therapists aren't allowed to diagnose themselves and they're not supposed, it's ethically considered wrong to diagnose people. They aren't themselves treating. Yeah. Uh, uh, it, the, the idea, like I just can't take that specific comment from like, Oh my God, a person with that level of, of, of Dunning Kruger, 
thinks I'm a narcissist. Oh, no. I'm pretty <laughs> sure the majority of cases of the word narcissism appearing on social media <laughs> are are typed out by people who simply do not understand what narcissism actually yeah. is. And they've just heard it. And they and it's the buzz, it's the buzzword. And it is. when they include it, they, they feel like they're important. Yeah. And unfortunately, my obsession now of talking with it definitely makes me look like a narcissist because I've, I've, I'm talking about it like crazy lately. I don't care as much about people calling me it. It's this concept that I have fallen for, by the way. I'm not saying I am free of this. And there are people where I go like, yeah, I'm not qualified, but I'm just sure if this person was put in front of a therapist. I'm again, I'm human. I have the same imperfections, but I'm trying not to broadcast those imperfections out as much. Uh, uh, the, this, this concept of everybody I hate is a narcissist is awful. Uh, in fact, there was a, yeah. a, a channel I used to watch or subreddit that I used to follow called raised by narcissists. And I left because there was too much of, there are stories where you're like, yep, that sounds like a narcissistic abuse. That sounds right. But then you get these other people, somebody had made a post that was like, has anybody uh, noticed that like now that they've been sort of in this channel for a long enough time that you can pretty much peg if a person's a narcissist within two minutes of meeting them, like pretty much immediately. And it was literally thousands of upvotes and person after person being like, yes, this, I know within a second of meeting someone, if they're a narcissist, like a fucking, yeah. <laughs> the irony of that statement, just person after person after person. And I was like, oh my God, they're not only doing this poorly, purely, they are doing it on, like, they are encouraging other people to do it purely, which is why I have also turned uh, away from things like self-diagnosis. I think we should have resources for everybody. And if you suspect it and it feels right for you, you should have the resources, whether you have money or not, to begin trying to do the workbooks and work on it and everything. But I, I, I've seen two badly abused phrases, of this, this concept of self-diagnosis, because the thing that people have to stop assuming is that everybody's good. At this, the moment you give permission to do something that's uh, a little bit of an iffy thing, the people who are manipulative dickbags are going to come and go, oh, well, here's my opportunity to do that, to fucking to get my way and abuse people with this. And it's been too overtaken. Um, oh, it, it's it's been completely weaponized. And I, I kind of wish in a way that I had your your confidence because, like, speaking for myself – you know, even though I know I'm not a narcissist, when when you hear it over and over and over yeah. again, Lloyd's a narcissist, Lloyd's a narcissist, Lloyd's a narcissist, it just in the back of your mind, you start thinking, oh, maybe I'm, a, maybe I actually am a narcissist, and I, I'm I'm not seeing it because I'm a narcissist. You know, yeah. and then and then you actually go and read and read books by psychologists that are spelling yeah. out narcissistic behavior. And, and you're reading it, or, or in my case, listening to the audio book, and you're thinking, what they're the person they're describing is a narcissist. Yeah. I, I don't relate to that person whatsoever in the specific areas that they're spelling out. So, but but my point is, you know, the the very fact that they've sent you spiraling into this kind of self doubt, where you're, yeah. where you're questioning yourself, uh, it, it's kind of gaslighting, isn't it? It's making you question, you know, your own. Right. Um, your own ethics, your and, own motives, it, whether really, you had thoughts really you had. Yeah. Tremendous. It's really toxic stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember I was talking with my therapist uh, and one of the times it come up because it, it has come up a bunch of times where the same thing where I'm like, yeah, I just, I, I worry about, I feel like that people in my family have these narcissistic traits and stuff. And then of course I exist as a public figure. So I get it called it like nine times a day. Um, and one of the uh, one of the things we had addressed in the same session was um, how surprising it is that everyone doesn't notice what a fraud I am because I have tremendous imposter syndrome. And she literally stopped. She's like, let's jump back to the thing we were talking about. You should know narcissists are always frustrated that everyone doesn't notice how incredible they are. You you are freaked out that yeah. people don't realize how stupid you are, which isn't the word yeah. she used, but it's the one I meant. And I was like, and that it's was the, the comfort I took where I was like, yeah. I really, that genuinely is true. The fact that I say it on here all the time and it's only half a joke. The fact that I can draw an audience and they think that I'm insightful. I think I am good at skepticism. And the thing I, the value I think I bring is showing that a stupid person 
can utilize skepticism effectively, that it is not, it does not require you to be some super genius or unobtainable. I recognize there are specific things I'm good at, and people will say that shows you have a proficiency in intelligence, but they are so hyper focused. I am good at production. I am stupid at so like if production was what we rated IQ on, then yes, I will look like I had a, a high IQ. If like very basic social existence, I am terribly stupid. Uh, uh, and so it's just it's just fun. Anyway, all of this Which to a say, narcissist would be unable to say. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe I, I'm just I maybe stupid, I'm such yeah. a good narcissist because remember, narcissists <laughs> nar therapy doesn't work on narcissists. They learn how to be better narcissists from therapy ah, and okay. maybe i've actually learned how to now so convincingly tell you i'm not a narcissist because that's how good of a narcissist i am had you thought there's of only that one way to settle this yeah there's only one way to settle this and it's with a live chat poll is <laughs> uh, is jimmy a narcissist uh uh, <laughs> uh this is on a postcard please hang on let me let me see um is Jimmy a significant narcissist? And the answers are oh, okay. yes or no, he's a marvelous narcissist. <laughs> you see, there's that sense of humor again. I love it. <laughs> I'm not getting out of here being called a narcissist without a compliment attached to it. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Jesus. All right, let's let's A train one of a uh, very cool reference. I love the boys. Uh five dollars from A Tage. Fudge you, Jimmy. Can't stop the A train, baby. So the quick explanation of the everybody telling me to go fuck myself and fuck you, Jimmy. We've basically I, I'm very uncomfortable being complimented. I just shut down, I get I, I get blushed. And so when people are like, oh my god, Jimmy, I love the show, da 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 da. I, I quickly try to get them to move past it and not and we don't even allow people to call in just to tell us. They like what we're doing. That's actually you get you get bumped. Uh, and so the joke actually became at one point, like I would be more comfortable with you telling me to go fuck myself than telling me you think I'm great. And then it sort of started to catch on. And now it's now it's an official thing. And the genius that there is here that I didn't intend. So it's not my genius. It's the it's situational genius. I now have no idea who loves me and who hates me because they're both telling me to mm. go fuck myself. So I can just assume they all love me. It's it's fun. I, I, I kind of feel jealous that I don't have that on my channel. Yeah. To be honest. Implement I, it. I love it. I and it's also something that you could only come up with if you weren't a narcissist. No, that or unless I was such a good narcissist. Oh God, here we go. Remember, again. Yeah. <laughs> I'd either the two options are either I'm not a narcissist or I'm so good at being a narcissist I've learned to blend in better than anybody else. Don't oh. ever forget that. Okay. A yeah. hyper narcissist. Yeah, I want. Okay. I feel like both of those are good qualities. Either not being a narcissist is a good quality, or being the best narcissist. Oh my if god! If you're gonna do it, if you're gonna do it, do it properly. Do it, do it the best. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I love this day. Uh, Kathleen Moncleef says. I'm an ex-Mormon, and I used to sit next to a JW girl in school when I was about seven. She told me she hated church, and I told her I did too, and she was the first person I ever said that to. I hope she got out. Go fuck yourself, Jimmy. Thank you, Kathleen Moncleef. I, uh, I, I, had, I was not that type of seven-year-old. I was the I was proselytizing at seven. I was trying to change. Uh, uh, I remember at some point, no, I would have been six because I was at an elementary school in Tennessee, uh, and I was trying to convert the only Hindu Indian kid in the class and probably the state of Tennessee also, because I don't know if you've seen Tennessee, uh, but it's anyway, he was, he was the only Hindu uh, and Indian kid in the class and, and there were no other Mormons. And I was like, I even asked the teacher one time, can I sit next to, he, he went by Joseph, but I don't think it was his, his like actual social name when he wasn't in school. I was like, can I sit next to Joseph? We want to argue more about which religion's true. And I'm six. S fucking uh. I, I see your I see your preaching to Hindus and I raise you yeah. as a young Jehovah's Witness at around this age. I was literally singing Jehovah's Witness hymns in the playground. So I yeah. think I win. 
you know, I I, 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 I properly took it seriously. Yeah, I've done. I've had playground. I've I've done playground hymns. The only thing that would have made it yeah. not happen more is that I used to like be embarrassed to sing in front of people, and now I now I just do it. I'm. I, oftentimes, I'm surprised it didn't happen today. Oftentimes, when I send a link to a guest to join, and then I put on music, but they can't hear my music, so so they join, and I'm just like, "Don't stop me now!" And I'm just singing into my mic like there's a performance, and like, "What's up, Jimmy?" And I'm like, "Shut up! I'm not done. Don't stop me because I'm having a good time." And it's, that's just who I am now. I don't, I don't give a fuck who hears it. I'm fun at karaoke. That's that's the person I want to be. I'm pretty sure that we're karaoke is awesome. I think YouTube's going to take me down. I don't think I had the uh, the license to sing that. <laughs> you <don't> see, <laughs> oh, yeah. At least the it wasn't the Beatles. The going to get you on that. That was right. so good. That was so convincingly Freddie Mercury, yeah. It's so spot on. They don't know I didn't <laughs> sample the voice. By the way, somebody asked me for this. No one super chatted it, but because it was requested and because I love you all, here's the uh, soundboard shortcut you were all requesting. That's the fucking point! That was... That was me from a week that ago. That is quite impressive. <laughs> that's that's yeah. the first time I've screamed on the channel. And I sound like Charlie Day when I scream, apparently. But the baritone goes away and I, I become a full-on soprano. You go high. You go high. I, I think I boom a bit when I shout, which doesn't happen very often. But I have been known to, to shout. Just so not on the channel yet. Yelling and screaming is different. If I'm yelling and I'm here, yeah, oh, I'm trying to be, I'm the big monster lion. If I go full lizard brain and I'm not thinking about it, what the fuck is wrong? <laughs> it's, it's, it's Charlie Al Day. Alex Jones, what are you doing here and what have you done with Jimmy Snow? Um, <laughs> that was freakishly Alex you know, Jones esque, that first you know, one. <laughs> I'm tired of them putting things in the water <laughs> that are turning the friggin' frogs gay. <laughs> That, that's that's right. Alex Jones. I'm sorry. Yeah. And then Charlie Day is. Do you know who Charlie Day is? Do you ever watch Always Sunny in Philadelphia? No, I don't oh. know. He's got a voice up here, and he's always talking like he was also on Horrible Bosses, and he he was gonna have sex with Jennifer Aniston, and that's like my that's the that's where I the screaming register comes in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, hey, have, when you're mad, you know the emotions can take you to all sorts of places vocally. Yeah. Yeah, if I'm somewhere in the middle, I'm sure it comes off J Jordan Peterson esque. Do you bloody mind? No, that that was good. Do you bloody <laughs> Do you bloody mind? That's Jordan Peterson. What, what do you mean by mind? What do you? Well, with the the lobsters and the hierarchy, if you if I tell you that you, because let's think about the the metaphysical, the substrate. Uh, it's. He's oh god, he is a parody of himself at the moment, isn't he? Yeah. He, he, somebody just has to who loves him sit him down and go, "Look, man, people were always mad at you, but this meat only diet is making you demonstrably insane. You look mm -hmm. like Gollum. You look like Smeagol and Go you look like you go into the room and you go, "Well, I just maybe I should treat trans people better no you don't treat trans people better treat us better well but what did they ever do to and by the way only eat beef and salt that's that's jordan peterson now it's he's but the he's depressing single. thing is here in croatia here in croatia they love him and Ugh. part of the reason is when you go into the bookstores his is his are basically the only friggin books you can see by <laughs> by american sorry canadian um <sighs> American authors. So um, it, it's frustrating. And I actually have people come up to me who they find out that I'm English and they immediately start talking to me about Jordan Peterson. And, and one guy <laughs> even got into a massive strop when I, when he found out that I don't like Jordan Peterson and he got started getting super defensive. It's really quite depressing. Yeah. I have 12 years of education to come here and tell you, you should <laughs> make your bed and clean your room. Oh God. It's like the most He's, look. I think I, I'm sure that in in his entire body of work, he's had some useful things to say about psychology. Sure. But the problem is he's been he's been pushed into realms that go that have nothing to do really with psychology, right? And and where he's just basically talking out of his rectum, right? And 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 that's that's where he's fallen apart. And and in a way, he's been tricked by his fan base into thinking that he knows more and has more to say on stuff than he really has or knows. It's quite sad. Yeah. By the way, 
The problem here, I think that we're both saying, as you and I qualified to do so, is that Jordan Peterson has narcissistic personality disorder. I think we're both saying Oh, <laughs> God. Dare I even we're, say that? We're so qualified. Uh, somebody the other day had tried to point out, like, <laughs> we're, well, they didn't say narcissist. They didn't say narcissist personality disorder. They said narcissist. I was like, cool. But if somebody throws autistic at me as a pejorative, when I am autistic, that doesn't mean they're not saying I'm on the spectrum. What are you, what are you trying to say here? To say an action seems narcissistic has a colloquial meaning and maybe even value. But to call someone mm. a narcissist isn't, isn't meaningfully separate from trying to say you think they have that diagnosis. I, I guess for me, narcissism relates directly, in, at least in my experience, relates directly to control and controlling situations and controlling yeah. relationships. And uh, I, I struggle to see Jordan Peterson in quite that light, but um, for sure there's, there's a bit of a cult following developing around him, which yeah. is troubling. It wouldn't surprise me. Uh, uh, it's one of those things where in my imperfection and inability to diagnose, I would go like, okay, yeah, he seems like it. The, there there are those people out there that have the like, it so knocks you on the head. It's almost like other disease, uh, like diseases that are visible where you're like, somebody's like coughing up blood and you're like, oh, you've got tuberculosis. And somebody's like, whoa, aren't you jumping the gun there? It's like, well, whether I'm not, am or not, they're coughing up blood. Uh, that's a bad mm. example because there's lots of reasons to cough up yeah. blood. But during a tuberculosis outbreak, it wouldn't be crazy. And so you see someone like Donald Trump where you're like, it's hard to not fall for that. And and you even have people who are licensed physicians breaking the ethical code and going like, yeah, but just so you all know, he got it. He got it real bad. <laughs> uh, uh, one of them's his niece that, that she's actually... That actually Indeed. makes her less qualified yeah. to do so. But uh, uh, sometimes you've got to call a spade a spade. I agree with that. Right, yeah. right, right, right. It's it's hard when it's normally applying it, but when narcissistic personality disorder raises itself into human form out of the dictionary, what do you do? Yeah, <laughs> what do you do anyway, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'm keeping you up terribly late. Let's we'll wrap these up. Sarah Dye says, "Crazy to say, but I've been catching up on Cause I Wanna, and I've been listening to you since 9 a.m. today." Thank you for your content. Love you both. Go fuck yourself. Sarah, you've actually just identified one of the things that I get in my head about and I freak out about because it, it has occurred to me multiple times that in the last, I guess it'd be about four and a half years, there's not been a moment in the last four and a half years that somebody somewhere on the planet wasn't listening to my voice. And that's kind of awful. <laughs> that that freaks me out to no end. Have you ever considered that sort of thing of... Yeah. Yeah, have you have you ever seen like I don't know whether they still do it, but YouTube Studio used to give you a map of all of the different countries, and you could yeah, mouse you over it, and it would show you like in Kazakhstan, you know, two people uh, in in the last uh, few weeks watched your. Ch it, it, it freaks you out. It really does. I mean, I, I guess it's nice. Um, but if one of my viewers comes to me and says, I've watched all of your videos, I I'm not thinking, you know, this is, you know, uh, what, what's the word? Level level complete, proceed to next level. I'm thinking this is actually quite tragic. Have you, I mean, have you seen yeah. the, the video where I, where I get out every single Jehovah's Witness Bible in my collection and put it on the table? That was a terrible video. Terrible you know? video, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah it, it's funny because, I. by the way, Sarah, I'm not saying you're creepy or anything. I, I'm not saying that. I'm no. saying I've been so harmed by the minority of people with intense parasocial problems Yeah, that it, I can't help but have my lock up when people are like, I just watch you a ton. And I'm like, okay, tell me your other character flaws. <laughs> like, that's, that's, that's hard. <laughs> This is Jimmy being humble, and this is Jimmy kind of recognizing that there are other ways that you can spend the majority of your day other than watching his content, and he's extremely flattered. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure, sure. I just, yeah. 
you know, I, uh, I, 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 humility is self-loathing truly is what it is. Just a deep, deep <laughs> self-loathing. But Sarah, I will say, I very much appreciate you watching. I watched, or I made those episodes. It's called Cause I Wanna, cause I do them when I wanna. And the fact that you would listen to them when you wanna is very nice. And I appreciate the support. And, and the good news is everything we do now to gain support, the line's vision and where we're trying to go and, and the ability to hopefully in the future open things like community centers and, and all the stuff we're heading toward that's my end goal so i'm very glad to have your support uh, uh for any reason i just wish you had a better reason than it be than my terrible voice uh i don't know i'm glad you're here i'm i i can't do anything but self-deprecate uh das daciana daciana van price says boyfriend left the jehovah's witnesses church years ago his parents are still in it and are still in his life i'm getting concerned about about probably being cornered by his mom and would hate to destroy what little relationship there is. Mm, that's a hard one. Yeah. Um, look, I think um, that there are different expectations on you to your boyfriend. So your your boyfriend's parents aren't going to expect you to be full of uh, you know praise for the organization. Um, it's definitely a like a, an area where where there's a bit of diplomacy needed uh, but don't feel like there is an expectation for you to say tell them how wonderful their religion is because um you know i think you can with a bit of uh you know kind diplomacy and a, li a little bit of good communication you could maybe even just sit down with them and say you know, look, I think our relationship will probably be better if we don't talk about religion than if we do, because, you know, I, I've done a, a lot of research into your religion and I've come to certain conclusions that you probably don't want to hear. So, you know, let's cut a deal sort of thing. I think with yeah. a bit of communication and a bit of you know, kind of mature dialogue, you can negotiate your way through that. I agree. Uh, next one we've got too young to feel this old says I've spent considerable time in Missouri. It is Eden compared to Arkansas. Sorry, not sorry. Yeah. I'd rather get punched in the balls than punched in the, no in the nose. Uh, like <laughs> these aren't, it doesn't make it good. <laughs> Which would you prefer a punch, a punch, a punch to the old nards or a punch to the nose? Um, I'd probably go for the nuts, to be honest. Same. I hate being punched in the face. Yeah. 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 Lasting visible damage. I've recovered from, I, you know, I grew up with brothers. I've recovered. My nards have recovered as far as I know many times. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. But a broken nose, I luckily, the second time my nose broke, it kind of straightened it. You can only tell if you get real close that I've got a, a crick in my nose from, from having it being, being broken. Um, <laughs> I got cookies. On, it said in the chat that I used to idolize Jimmy on his other channel. Now I realize my mistake, and I wrote nothing undermines a hero like meeting them. Uh, because I got cookies is now in, you know in our little little group of friends and mods and stuff. And she replied, "At least you weren't a dick." Well, I just have to say the night is still young. <laughs> the word yet probably belongs somewhere, uh, but we'll see. <laughs> Tyrell, Tyrell Dactyl says, for the JP impression, have you seen the Peterson-themed word salad generators? Yes, years ago, we played a game around one where you had to guess whether or not it was uh, Jordan Peterson or um, the word salad generator. That We did actually... I, I, I've, I've taken never that heard down. of that before. That sounds fascinating. It's, and doesn't that kind of say everything that you, <laughs> that you can have such a thing? I mean, you know, you... Presumably, it would be very, very difficult to have like uh, a Jimmy Snow themed kind of response generator because you I know hope, what you say know. isn't isn't predictable. Yeah. Um, but when 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 Jordan Peterson, who let's be honest, is being venerated as like one of the leading minds of of on the planet for our generation, when what he says and the gibberish that comes out of his mouth can be created artificially. That says a lot, doesn't it? I've just created one. Uh, the metaphysical, or sorry, the metaphorical is the path to reckless choices. <laughs> he would usually add a, you know, similar. Well, you know, the metaphorical is the path to reckless choices. Uh, well, 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 what do we mean by choices? This is important. <laughs> 
The most real truth <laughs> reflects existential observations, as you know. That's babies get that. Knowledge expresses oh. total timelessness. It's uh, you need yeah, to it's, do the hands at the same time. Knowledge, yeah. total timelessness, total. <laughs> He stole those hand gestures from Neil deGrasse Tyson, I noticed, years ago. He didn't used to do them, and now oh, he, okay. he stole them from, from Neil, I feel. Uh, he okay. used to do this. Well, when you decipher <laughs> how up yours woke moralists, we'll see who cancels who. That was his old bit. Wow. Yeah, yeah I recognize that, yeah. Yeah, that's good stuff. Anyway, uh, that's it. It's over. Uh, Lloyd, you want to tell people where to find you? Uh, and then we'll go. Don't find me. Leave me alone. Uh, if you Literally what I say on... when I go on other shows. I, I, or I'll lie. I'll just <laughs> say, like, me. I'll say, like, I I don't know why I was invited on the show. I make ergonomic BDSM furniture for ferrets. Uh, so if you need yeah. that, Google me. The, fi the finest dildos in Croatia can be found on uh, the Lloyd Evans channel on there YouTube. You Excellent. Just the Lloyd Evans, that's my name. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you for joining me. I feel that we just did two and a half hour, two and hours and 45 minutes of two very fine dildos on the line. Uh, <laughs> thank you, everybody. We'll, we'll, we'll see you back here tomorrow. I'm filling in for Matt on the hangup. Arn Ra will be joining. And then Arden will be hosting Transatlantic on Thursday. And then the normal schedule res will resume Sunday. Have a good night, everyone. Take care.